and how are y'all doing? <laughs> okay. Well, here we are. It's a pleasure to be here in the town of Anger in spring, and uh, it's good to see all of your faces. Let's um, start with the Pledge of Allegiance and followed by the invocation. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with everything and justice for all. You remain standing. Almighty God, we ask that you uh, be with us. We're here representing the town of Anger, one of your favorite places, I suspect. Uh, may we give pleasure to you in the things that we consider and in the things we do tonight. Uh, bless us in every respect as we do the business of this town. Amen. All right, let me say um, something first here. Um, this this is the gavel, and as we uh, are moving into the political season, uh, sometimes things get a little uh, out of order. So my intention as the presiding officer is to keep things in order respectfully, and I ask that everybody be respectful, and let's uh, get our job done here uh, without rancor and without uh, accusation. So uh, the agenda is before the board. Uh, are there any changes to the agenda? Is there a motion to approve the agenda? I make a motion that we approve the agenda. Okay, the motion is to approve the agenda as written. Uh, any discussion, further discussion? If not, all in favor, uh, please raise your right hand. And it is approved. All right, if uh, representatives of the Anger Senior Citizens Club would come forward, please. Y'all uh, introduce yourselves, please. Irma Duke, President of Andrew Senior Citizens. Rachel Barnes, just a member. Jack of all trades. Right. Cheryl Duncan, Vice President. Shirley Hawley, Treasurer. Okay. Well, we have a proclamation celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Andrew Senior Citizens Club. Whereas and your senior, senior Citizens Club has been serving the older citizens of our community since 1973. So this is their uh, the 50th anniversary. The and your, senior, and your Senior Citizens Club is a valuable resource that continues to serve as leaders, mentors, volunteers, and important and active members of the community. Whereas the and your Senior Citizens Club is proud to work with town leadership in enriching this segment of our population through fun, fellowship, and education. Whereas the Andrew Senior Citizens Club provides board games and other fun activities, travel experiences, service opportunities, seminars, and other educational segments that enhance life for the folks who have given so much to our town in years past. Whereas for many years, the Andrew Senior Citizens Club has provided an outstanding health fair to offer vaccinations, health screenings, and other resources to our seniors. Now, therefore, I, Robert K. Smith, Mayor of the Town of Anger, along with the members of the Anger Board of Commissioners, encourage all residents to recognize and celebrate 50 successful years of many accomplishments of our seniors and the contribution 
that they have made to the town. Congratulations. Okay, the next item is uh, system development fee analysis. We have to do this every four or five years or so, and Cecil Rhodes is going to come up. He's with EnviroLink, and he's going to present uh, an analysis. Okay. What? I don't know. Oh, not yet. Okay, Cecil. Mayor and Council, thank you very much for once again having to endure me speaking for just a few minutes, and I will try to make it brief. We do go through this process uh, every five years for your system development fee. Uh, is this set to go? Yes. Um, you want to explain why we do this, Cecil? Um, the system development fee, uh, House Bill 436 actually established a mechanism where towns can charge fees for new connections in order to compensate investment made by the existing customers and the capacity in the system. Basically, every system has to be built slightly larger than it needs to be in order to take care of growth. This is the way that you recoup the cost of that from new customers coming in in the fairest and most equitable manner we can find. So new customers are sharing the load. New customers are sharing the load for what's already there and what is already being paid for by the existing customers. Right. Okay. So uh, it's just a means for to collect revenue for new customers to offset the additional capacity that's paid for by existing customers on your system. You can't build a system to serve just what you have today. You always have to put in more, and so you needed a way to uh, to get revenue from that from the new customers. It's delayed. delay here okay uh, the town of Anger system development fee has been updated in accordance with House Bill 436 it's reasonably detailed and identifies all the assumptions and the conditions generally accepted accounting engineering and planning methodologies and produces a maximum per unit fee that can be adapted to different size customers basically it's analysis that says this is how much new customers on an average size would come in, need to contribute to the system to compensate the existing customers. Um, well, it went way down. Okay. The process, uh, the, the system development fee has been updated. The findings have been presented to you in your previous meeting. This is the meeting where you actually received the copy of the system development fee for posting. The system development fee needs to be posted on your website for a period of 45 days before you can proceed any further. After public hearing, after 45 days for consideration of any comments, at that time you can adopt the new system development fee by the board. It needs to be published in your annual rate plan and ordinance, and it has to be updated every five years. This is your first update. The process, we've been through this before. There's a buy-in methodology. There's an Excuse me. There's an incremental methodology that's included in your in your analysis, and their system development fees can be only be used for specific things, and that is to pay for capital additions on your water and sewer system. The fees are not allowed to be transferred anywhere else. They stay within the utility system. Uh, we went through this before. Slide it up, please. The calculated number was. $310 per average residential customer, new hookup, 
and 2,361 on sewer for the average residential customer from new hookup. All the calculations are made for an average size house, an average residential customer. Uh, by rounding those up, excuse me, we round those down to give you an actual good number to put into your rates. That's $310 for the water, 2361 with a total of $2,671 for water and sewer for your average size house. This is only slightly more than you already have in place, and I'll get to that in just a minute. As a matter of fact, didn't there it is. <laughs> your, current, your current system development fee is $2,659. So after five years, the increase is $2,671 for the combined. Water only pays water, sewer only pays sewer, combination pays the combination. Uh, where you're at, this is a comparison of the best information we can find right now. Relatively speaking, in your area, as you can see, um, you're very reasonable in your rates with what other towns and cities are ch uh, charging, either your size or your location. Um, <clears throat> next on the steps to do this, and that's why I've been here for last two meetings and I'll hopefully we'll only be here for two more. So you've only got a little bit longer to endure me. Oh. Um, the town has received the system development fee for posting. Uh, posting has to be for 45 days before you can make any action on it. Um, at the, right now the current schedule says June 6th meeting after the 45 day posting ends. We'll review and address any comments, we'll modify as needed, and at the June 6th Board of Commissioners meeting, we'll request approval for the July 1st, 2023 implementation. That'll be your five-year schedule. That's any questions. Any questions, board members? I notice that it's just a, a small update. Um, Five years ago, we had to increase it to to meet uh, existing conditions, but it seems like it's holding its own pretty well. Five years ago was your first time under the conditions of House Bill 436, and so that changed the playing field for everyone. That's why it took a little bit longer that time. And just to be clear, the House Bill is now a general statute? Yes. Okay. Or the law. Okay. Any questions of uh, Cecil? Thank you. Good presentation. Thank okay. you, sir. The mayor, I think we need a motion to accept the presentation and authorization to. Okay. Is there is there such a motion? <clears throat> and post and post it for the required forty five days. Okay. Any discussion on that motion? All in favor, raise your right hand. Okay, it's unanimous, Madam Clerk. All right. Um, there are two architectural firm presentations. Uh, Richard, you want to explain what we're doing here? Yeah. Tom, at your retreat, you indicated you wanted to move forward on some of these projects. And I went out and did some, some additional research, and I tried to find you a, a couple of architects techs that are more regional in nature for this area and the type of buildings you want to build. This is kind of their bread and butter, what they do. So I invited both of these to make a presentation to you on their business, what their qualifications are, and then later you can decide if you like you know, one or both or whatever. So, so we're not necessarily approving it tonight. We're just receiving no, no, the we just presentation. Want their presentation okay. tonight. If you got any questions for them, or if you want any additional information, I'd right. be happy to provide it. And um, the first presentation is by Clear Scapes um, Architectural. Okay, if you will come forward, please. Oh no. <laughs> you come over to the podium so we can hear you, please, ma'am, and identify yourself. So, good afternoon. I'm Brandy Thompson. I am a principal at ClearScapes. Okay. Can you all hear that out? Madam Clerk, can we turn the... 
Is this a, is it on? Yes, it's on. Okay. So just just right. just be conscious to be close to it. Okay. All right, I'll try to keep my my mouth very close. So I'm Brandy Thompson. I'm a principal at Clearscape. So thank you so much for having us here today. I'll try to speak loudly. Maybe it's better to assume that you can't hear me. You can hold, you can hold like, it. You think? Okay. All right. It's on. All right. You can hear me. Yes. Okay. All right. It sounds quiet from my side, so sorry about that. Um, would you like me to advance my own slides? Is that how we should plan? Okay. Perfect. All right. So, um, like I said, I am a principal at Clearscapes. I've been with Clearscapes um, for coming up on 20 years now, which hurts my feelings that I'm getting old enough to be able to say that. Um, I grew up outside You've of... You started as a teenager? I did as a <laughs> four-year-old, right? Um, I grew up outside of Goldsboro, so I am a, a lifelong North Carolina resident and native, um, and I love small communities, right? Small and growing communities. All right. Um I'll share tonight a brief overview about our firm, our experience designing community centers and police stations, and just a little bit about our process and how we hope to partner with you to realize your goals and aspirations for these projects. All right, so Clearscapes began in 1981 in Raleigh as a collaboration between an artist and an architect around the idea that architecture could and should be more than simply a functional um, facility, right? It needs to really help us uh, reach our aspirations and our goals, and it needs to bring us together as a community. All right. We are a hub certified WBE full service design firm who partners with our public and private clients to help achieve their community goals through creative planning and design. Our firm is locally owned and operated. We're the sole office of Clearscapes, right where we started. Uh, we have nine licensed architects, five architectural designers, and two administrative assistants. We work across a range of scales and project types, all the way from a $75,000 renovation for a startup chocolate factory to a $2 million convention center. Our designs range from subtle additions to national historic landmarks um, to singular expressions like a building wrapped in a million illuminated marbles for a children's museum. In parallel, our public art practice creates a range of large-scale works that tell the story of communities across the country. So we really specialize in creating people places. We have over 40 years of experience working in communities just like Anger across North Carolina, and we really understand um, the responsibility that comes with designing heavily used public spaces like these and, and the accountability for upholding your aspirational vision while also investing every dollar to achieve um, the greatest value. And a significant um, percentage of our portfolio is dedicated to uh, civic and municipal work. We also specialize in cultural and community spaces. Designing public projects like these requires building consensus among complex stakeholder groups to deliver highly functional and beloved buildings and spaces. We're committed to work with you and your stakeholders to understand your aspirations, needs, and available resources, and then generate a design solution for the projects that effectively balance those parameters. All right, so getting into a little of our experience, um, this is Chavis Memorial Park and Community Center. Um, Originally, the park was constructed by the WPA during the Jim Crow era, and John uh, Chavis Memorial Park served as a community anchor for Raleigh's South Park neighborhood, as well as a major destination park for African Americans from Atlanta to Washington, D.C. And this pro pro project, sorry, uh, was really just the first phase, and it was meant to be implemented in phases um, over time. So coming up in a few years, actually, we're expecting an RFQ to be released any time now for a large natatorium to a, a, a Company, this particular project. All right. So the new 40,000 square foot Lead Silver Community Center is carefully cited to preserve the cultural landscape of the National Register listed park and to create space for additional park amenities. The building occupies an otherwise unusable slope near the center of the site, linking the upper level of the park to the lower level of the 29 acre park. 
Site amenities include a 7,000 square foot splash pad, a 2,500 square foot carousel house that was converted into community gathering spaces, and a destination playground. And the design of the park aspires to be a tangible expression of the community that it serves. The building houses not only community recreation spaces, a gymnasium with an indoor walking track, a group fitness uh, room, a weight room, locker rooms, but also community spaces for the city's parks and rec programming and department, large community gathering spaces, and a lounge that overlooks the city, city skyline are two of my favorite spaces in the entire complex. And we've also enjoyed a long-standing relationship with the town of Clayton. Uh, we've designed several projects for that community over the years. The Clayton Center, which is their town hall and a large performance venue, um, the Clayton Community Center, and also the Clayton Law Enforcement Center. The Clayton Community, community Center was envisioned as a node along the mountains to sea trail, and it is the centerpiece of the park in which it sits. Its grand community porch welcomes the public and serves a variety of gatherings and events. The facility also contains a gymnasium, a walking track, fitness studio, but it also includes art and pottery studios, a dance studio, and a child care um, and youth program area that really complements the Parks and Recs Department um, full kind of summer and after school programming. And it's also the headquarters for the Parks and Rec Department offices. I will also say one, one more thing about that last project. It was designed and constructed during a, a pretty overheated construction market like what we're facing today. Um, we picked simple, durable, um, relatively inexpensive materials to uh, clad the uh, facility with to try to manage upfront costs, but we also designed in um, significant um, design alternates so that when the project went out to bid, there was a way, even if the bids came in too high, that we could proceed with that project. You would just lose the community porch or you would lose a, a specific piece or two. And so on bid day, we were actually able to bring it in under budget and we were able to achieve all of the um, design alternates. So we were, we were very pleased with that. Okay. So the town of Clayton for its law enforcement center acquired a full city block in the heart of their downtown to expand their outdated and undersized police station into a state-of-the-art law enforcement complex to serve their growing community. As a part of the town's mission to increase activity downtown, the facility is designed, public, is designed to encourage public interaction with the officers. All right. ClearScapes completed an extensive programming analysis for the police department and studied the existing site to develop a strategy for reducing construction costs by saving and renovating the existing police station in combination with building a significant new facility. The careful site and building design balances their present needs also with the future growth that was anticipated in that growing community. The complex includes full administrative office and support spaces for each division, training spaces, secure holding and evidence areas, and an expanded emergency communication center and data center to optimize efficiency and security for the long term. So you can see a training station or a training center and just a conference room on the right. Go ahead, sorry. All right, the town of Zebulon desired a centralized town hall and a police department headquarters to serve their rapidly growing community. The former Wake Lawn School campus, including the historic turn of the century Wake Lawn um, School and unremarkable 1960s uh, primary building was acquired by the town and converted into their new government complex. After meeting with all municipal departments to identify their present and future needs. So again, this idea of for growing communities, you have to plan not only for what you need today, but what you need 10, 15 years from now in your growing um, environment. We developed a detailed program and completed a thorough analysis of the existing buildings. We then developed a master plan and a subsequent detailed design to carefully integrate the new uses into the buildings that was implementable within the town's very limited resources, but still provided high quality public spaces that the town um, was very proud of. So while the existing character of the Wake Lawn School was intact, pretty much the inside had been gutted. There was nothing much left um, that was of any significance, so we again had to be pretty creative. Um, 
On the upper level was a council chamber that was dark, enclosed, um, not open to daylight. And we were able to open that up, put in a skylight, and really help um, bring some, some illumination and some interest to that space. And the police station, so this is the unremarkable 1960s edition, right, um, was judiciously repurposed. And so original um, open air walkways were enclosed to create secure um, access corridors for both administrative and um, other types of secure circulation routes needed for police stations. All right. And this is just a, a snapshot of the interior. So pretty Spartan, but highly functional. Wow. Okay. All right, we're currently working with um, the town of Hillsborough in the design of their new train station. And as a part of that facility, um, one way that town is maximizing the expense of the train station is to also in incorporate into it um, town hall chambers. So half the station is waiting and, and boarding for the train, and the other half is uh, town chambers, kind of like your situation here with the library. Um, in this case, the town chambers, you can see the town council chambers in the bottom image, is really meant to be a flexible space. So um, ordinarily, it's going to be set up for council meetings and things like that. But the tables and the furniture are intentionally designed to be able to be easily reconfigured for a multitude of different purposes. We've also looked into um, utilizing pre-engineered metal buildings more recently. The one on the top is for a brewery in Littleton, North Carolina. Um, in that case, um, we were proceeding with design during a time where we just couldn't get steel. Steel joists were not available for six to eight to 12 months, um, and the cost of, of building anything was significantly higher. So by using a pre-engineered metal building, we were able to kind of sidestep the, the wait time, the lead times, and also really manage tightly the cost. In that particular case, you can see it's um, a historic kind of looking uh, building that blends in with that historic downtown. On the bottom is a food hall that's being um, constructed in the North Hills kind of development complex. And that one, the, the client wanted a more kind of forward-looking and modern expression, but they also wanted to save money and get ahead of lead times by utilizing a pre-engineered metal building. So this is just a strategy to, to be thinking of. So multi-use multi facilities, creative ways to, to manage costs um, by using potentially pre-engineered systems. But really, really, the most important thing that the town can do is to endeavor into um, a strategic concept design phase very early on. And this is where a program is developed. Very um, early plan diagrams are created with square footages. And then, if you'll go to the next slide, um, some sort of volumetric studies are created, so some renderings. But really, it's about trying to express the qualitative um, aspects of the building. And essentially, all of that's leading up to the creation of a cost estimate. So from the very, very earliest stages of design, you know how big it is, you know what you need, and you know how much it's going to cost. And we don't leave this phase and enter into detailed design, schematic design through construction until we know that your aspirations and your goals are in balance with your budget. All right, and so detailed design, of course, there's lots of ways that um, we can manage costs even once we've moved past concept design at each stage of the process schematic design development construction documents will get a, a revised cost estimate so that, again, before we move on to the next, we can right size the project and make sure that it's still meeting your aspirations and your needs. And then during construction administration, it's really important for us to manage um, change orders and contractor cost. And we do that largely by keeping the same team that started on the project all the way through um, construction. Because when, when you put your heart and soul and blood, sweat, and tears into a project, you tend to treat it like your own, and you know what the goals are, you know what's most important, and it just avoids um, trading away your functional and aspirational goals while also um, allowing that kind of, while preventing really costly missteps. All right, so finally, again, our team is local. We're invested in helping communities like yours to achieve their goals and serve their residents through uplifting and cost-efficient design. Our team also has significant experience in designing municipal and culturally significant projects like community centers, police stations, and farmers markets. The one thing I'm most proud of is that 80% of our work is for repeat clients. And that 
is really built on long-standing trust-centered relationships that is the result of successful collaboration through design and really pro um, the development of projects that function well and inspire their users. So thank you so much for your time. Okay, what about questions from the board? I would think that we are looking at a fairly significant escalation since then. 2012 um, was in the pit of the recession, so we could buy a lot more with our dollars at that time than we can now. I would add at least 30% to that price to get the same quality and the Six same and size. Thank you. And a lot of that, I will, I will also say my, I'm optimistic that our market is shifting back towards a little more at least stability, if not reasonability. Um, the overall economy is cooling just a little bit. But I will say also in our, our recent bids, it's, it's still hot here. We're still dealing with um, significant escalation. Um, I know these projects all vary in size and shape and scale and everything of that nature, but just what roughly from beginning to end, what do you, what is your sort of guesstimate? How long is it taking to get these things done uh, in mm -hmm. time? I know it's different when each size, sure. a prefab building is going to be built quicker than something that requires more detail, but any idea of, uh, you know, Time frames or absolutely. So I think for for projects like these, a, a good design phase, a good process where we're meeting with you, we're making sure that we're in alignment, we're not making decisions out on our own. That's going to require at least a year for each of the projects. They can be run concurrently. It doesn't have to be you know sequentially, but design would be at least a year, and then construction would be at least a year on the back end of that. And there would be a bidding phase kind of built in with all of that. And if there's any other sort of regulatory hurdles. Um, that we would need to cross. I, I don't know anything about sites or potential things like that that we would need to consider, but there could be extenuating circumstances, right, that stretch mm -hmm. that out from a, a, site plan, a site plan process. But on average, a year for design and a year for construction of projects of about, I mean, once you get big, mm -hmm. it can be 18 months on each side. And you mentioned earlier, uh, have you done different types of uh, phase projects? Um, I, I do think that that is going to be an important factor in some of the things that we're looking at doing, yeah. um, you know, to, but I think uh, planning ahead and, yep. and being able to discuss, yes, that's a good idea for a standalone building or a single entity, but if you're looking to add on to the, in the future, certain things I know have to go into consideration. Absolutely. Building siding. I mean, almost all the projects that I, shared with you tonight were designed in phases or designed to have a second phase implemented after an initial phase. So it really comes down to thinking about the property or the parcel that a building is going to be constructed on if it's a new build or if it's an existing structure, how you situate any additions on the site to then leave room for future other anticipated additions. So um, it, it's just built into that sort of concept design process and then early SD to make sure that our assumptions about the sizing of things are really um, kind of playing out as we work through detailed <clears throat> design. Brandy, when you uh, when you get into the bidding processes, do you try to use local people? Yes. So you'll be in a public bid situation. Um, I would recommend, no matter what you do, to um, pass an ordinance that lets you pre-qualify bidders. Um, we have seen. In a low bid kind of situation, we've seen all kinds of folks show up and put a bid in, and we're then kind of after the fact challenged to prove that they're not qualified, right? So that I would say thing one would be do a pre-qualification process and get the legal means to be able to do that as a public entity in place in advance of your projects. And then second, we have a, a strong pool of sort of trusted local contractors that we enjoy work we have we have ones that we would say don't ever work with them right so we have we have some favorites who we think would do right by you as um, a client and and would manage your money well and not try to take advantage of you and not be um, unfair 
with your money um, yeah. that we could recommend and also invite to the project. Th- these, mm. I, I'm anticipating that these projects are going to be of a big enough scale that it will attract some, you some decent you bidders. You hold on this subcontract? Um, we do. So as a part of, so we usually use the AIA um, mm. sort of payment application and, and work through an AIA um, contract document process. And with that, it's a 5% retainage all the way through until 80% of design. And then it drops down to two and a half percent unless there's some unusual, you know, larger pieces of equipment or something, right? There, there might be reasons you want to hold on to the retainage a little longer. Um, but there's, and that's not paid out until the project is complete. And you all would be the acting like general contractor for the site? We, we, or do y'all contract that out? We are licensed only to provide design services. So we, we are architects. We have um, consulting engineers that we hire and bring in, but we are not general. We can't build. But we would facilitate the town bidding it out and securing a contractor to be able to then build. And they would have the licensing and would be able to manage the entire construction process for the town. But we would stay on as your agent reviewing payment applications, making sure that things are getting built according to the contract documents, and just making sure that, that they're generally complying with the contract requirements. Any other questions? Explain to me, then, oh, excuse me. Why, why, what would be the advantage to go with a firm like yours or Davis Kane when we could go straight to a general contractor and them do the same thing and cut out your portion of it? So I, I would... Um, there are several different ways that you could think about approaching the project. One is a traditional design bid build. That's what we're, I think what we're talking about for um, tonight. Design bid build looks like you have your design in place by an independent third party that's not doing the, the construction work themselves. And then you work together from a, a design standpoint to make sure it's what it needs to be, that it complies with building codes and, and meets all the requirements that way, and that it meets your cost and, and needs, then we would help you put it out to bid. And mm-hmm. then the general contractors would give you competitive pricing across the board on um, all the trades, but also their numbers. So it, it would be a closed book situation. You'd have the low bid, and then you, you could ask for plumbing, mechanical, and electrical to be broken out so you can see those large kind of building system items. Um, and, and what they're tracking at. But ultimately, um, that way, I, I think, is probably the fairest for your town, just from the standpoint. And I think it's probably the fairest for most, um, most clients because you know what you're, going, what you're getting into day one. Um, there's also a CM at risk or construction manager at risk, which sounds a little bit more like what you might be talking about, mm-hmm. where you do a qualifications-based selection of Mm -hmm. a construction manager and then um, you would still have to have in that situation a separate design contract Mm -hmm. through a firm like ours Mm -hmm. Um, and then they would they would be brought on as a team member for pre-construction and then they would bid it out individually to all the various trades and subs and then come back and give you kind of a complete bid we we've seen um that method of delivery get um, utilized to take advantage of clients more often than not. The construction manager at risk, there's no risk. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's something that you get into and the price kind of just tends to tick upward. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, there is the ability also to do a design build, which is you would do a qualifications-based selection of, your, of the contractor that you mm-hmm. wanted to work with, and then they would, through a contract underneath their umbrella, mm-hmm. bring a design team on to mm-hmm. do the design. So then we were separate entities, but we're working for our contractors with the general contractor in that situation. I've only been involved with one project like that so far because it's a newer project delivery model. It's, um, we had a good experience because the contractor that we were working with was a very reputable one, but it, it kind of, um, you're, you're beholden to them a little bit more in the sense that your, your primary contract is not with someone who's not doing the construction work. Right. Mm -hmm. So our, our goal is to represent you fairly and to get you to a place where you have a design that you believe in that's not based on things that might make the project better or more profitable for the contractor. Yes, so there's several different ways, and I'm sorry for giving such a long no, that's fine. D- description about it, but um, <clears throat> it, it is a decision that as a group you'd want to make and really understand, I think, the different options available to you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? 
All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very thorough. Okay. Richard? All right. Uh, Robert Stevenson with um, Davis Kane Architects is the next presentation. Can you hear me? Yeah, why don't you just pull that off and hold it up to your mouth? All right. I'm sorry. Is that better? It might be better if you just hold it. Okay. <laughs> that was a great presentation. And like Brandy, I'm 24 years old. <laughs> That's, that is not true. Um, I'm Robert Stevenson. I'm president of Davis Kane Architects. Uh, we are also are a local firm, local to Raleigh. Uh, we started in 1977, and last year we had our 45th anniversary. It was a very wonderful event. Um, I'm very proud to say I've been there for 30 plus years, um, and I've seen a lot of great things happen in the company. We have a lot of great people. Bradley will give the majority of the presentation, but I want to talk a little bit about uh, our firm, uh, starting with introducing Bradley McClung, who's a senior architect with us uh, talented dedicated great guy I love working with him the focus of our firm has been uh, uh, providing great service and building trust in our client base um, like clearscapes we have a lot of repeat clients and they are our bread and butter and they have allowed us to build our firm to what it is today over the 45 years um, it's easy to lose trust, it's very hard to build it. And what I tell clients, uh, prospective clients, is I've got nothing to gain in this process except at the end of the day, you are happy and you would call me back. I'm gonna make a living, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make some money, everybody has to, we have to survive. But the satisfaction I get is that you're happy and that we have a relationship and you'll call me again. Um, so that has kept me motivated uh, many times because it's not always an easy job. Uh, keeping our expectations aligned is a very difficult thing. You know, you, you are starting a process here. And you have a goal in mind. I may have an entirely different vision of what that looks like. So it's very, it's very important and it's, very time, uh, it's time well spent at the beginning of the project to understand what your needs and expectations are and let us tailor our services to satisfy those. Without that understanding, uh, there's a chance for a mismatch and not having a happy ending. Nobody wants that. Uh, firm introduction, like I said, we have, I think also, nine licensed architects on our firm, two interior designers, two admin staff, and are you advancing the slides? Can you do that? Okay, next please. Uh, who we are, I've kind of covered that. Uh, our our fundamental services are, are very uh, uh, basic architectural services. We do a lot of planning and programming. We do uh, construction administration, all the design services, including interior design. We don't have any in-house engineering staff. Uh, we're purely AE and interior design and planning. Uh, that's uh, That's our focus, and we don't intend to muddy the waters in our firm in any way. Next, please. Simple diagram showing uh, kind of our focus. We've worked in the middle third of North Carolina our entire uh, uh, existence. We've worked outside of the state on very few occasions just for special clients. The majority of the work is within three hours driving distance, and we're happy that uh, there's enough work in this area to keep us sustained as well as many other firms. So we feel no need to really branch out much further. We feel we can service our clients better in this circle and that's uh, how we will uh, move forward. Um, next, please. The team you would see for this project is myself, Jimmy Edwards, who is out of the state today, but he has a significant amount of experience in uh, municipal projects. Bradley McClunk I just introduced, and Devonche Casaria is also out of town, and she has a lot of experience in community centers, also uh, in uh, municipal and higher education projects. Very talented group, very dedicated group. Next, please. 
I'm going to let Bradley take it from here. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank Brandy for covering basically 90% of what I'm going to say today. Um, <laughs> but like, like Robert was saying, um, we spent a lot of time up front on the project, understanding your needs, your wants, your desires, aligning your budget, your goal, your timeline, so that we understand everything so that we can get into the conceptual design, the design development, and move, move forward. And along the way, like Brandy said, we, you know, we, we run cost estimates in-house, but we also use a third-party cost estimator to make sure that we're keeping everything on budget and on schedule. Um, next slide, please. Um, what, what we feel is very important to a community like yours is engaging not only the key stakeholders, but bringing on community members, bringing on you know, neighboring, resident, neighboring residents and the design team, um, making the whole process very inclusive to understand what your wants are, you know, how we can meet your goals. And we do that by you know, community outreach, public workshops, target focus groups, visioning uh, sessions, online surveys, and then benchmarking tours, which you'll kind of see in some of our projects later on. But that gives us the tools we need to make sure that we're, we're in alignment with what you want at the end of the day. Next slide, please. Um, we, we take a lot of pride in maintaining the schedule. So we, we take a really deep dive and figure out what it's going to take to get us there, make sure that you're aware of the schedule as well along the way, the, the whole process. Um, but what, what, basically what we do is a discovery period up front, and then we're kind of exploring design charrettes, um, making sure that you know, everything is in alignment. That, and then you know, along the way, we re refine that and get you the design that you want that fits your needs so that you're happy at the end of the day. Uh, next slide. Um, another, another key part of what we like to do is we look at materials, we look at life cycle, um, and, and make sure that your budget is in alignment, that it, you know, it's, everything's a balancing act at the end of the day. So we'll look at systems, materials, all the way along the process and making sure that we're delivering exactly what you need and what is best for you. Next slide. Um, kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, but in Brady did as well, that you know, at each phase of the design, we're going to go through cost checkpoints, whether it's in-house or if we're using a third-party estimator to make sure that, you know, there's, there's no surprises at, the, at bid day. Um, and if we see a number that's jumping out, then we can come up with alternatives that, you know, keep the project in alignment with what, you, what it needs and you don't lose anything. Um, next slide. And, you know, again, construction administration, the team that is in with you in the design phase is going to be with you the whole way through construction administration. Um, we collaborate with contractors using the latest technologies, and we just make sure that the project is successful for you. Um, project experience. We have quite a bit of public safety work going around town, um, around the Triangle, and some of it outside, out the coast, out in Jacksonville. Um, we'll let Robert talk a little bit about the community projects. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this uh, public safety renovation in Kinston was one of the early projects we performed uh, in the public safety realm. There were two existing fire stations that we assessed and renovated, as well as building a new fire station one headquarters for the town, uh, and also two new outlying uh, stations, single base stations. Uh, the public safety re renovation was downtown in downtown Kinston, which was very depressed. Uh, their budget was very tight. We were able to renovate and restore their operations center there, and it's in use today. Uh, phase project, again, due to the budget constraints, we did tailor the design and construction uh, to be phased over several years so they could uh, uh, kind of pay as you go to, to fund this project. All right, next slide. These are some images of uh, the uh, public safety renovation project there. The diagrams in the center are part of the discovery and programming phase where we engage them in the programming, uh, 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 program development, talking about each of the spaces and the space needs, the sizes and the qualities and features. 
after that is finalized, we're able to design the plans and continue uh, to, to the final design and then to the construction. Next, please. I'll talk a little bit about this one since I'm working on it right now. The town of Nightdale is uh, currently building a couple fire stations. Their, their, pub, their current office for the fire police is all in one public safety building where the police only have about 5,000 square feet. In a growing community that's rapidly growing, they've learned that they've really out, they have nowhere to go. So the fire, the fire is getting kicked out, and we are going to renovate this facility all for the police department. So what we've started with them is going through uh, program verification. We've gone on benchmarking tours. And one of, the, one of the buildings we actually went to was Clayton, beautiful building, by the way. Um, and a couple of them. So we did that as kind of a lessons learned process to learn you know, what, what works for these police departments, what doesn't work. And we've discovered a lot. And you'll see kind of, you know, next slide, please. Some of the spaces that we've seen and learned what to do and what not to do. Um, and we're currently working on the programmatic phase with them and hopes. Um, I guess one, one key note to bring up on this, Mr. Price, is this, this town of Nightdale is in, use, utilizing a design bridge build concept where the design team takes the design to 35% and then they bid it out on a qualification, well, actually not on qualifications, on a monetary package, and then they marry the constructor to the designer. Mm -hmm. So it's it's kind of a new concept. It may be something worth looking into. It's it's new to us, so mm -hmm. we're all we're all learning about it right now. So. Next slide. And we're, right now we're kind of going through some some precedent studies to figure out how to secure their site. You know what what they like and. Getting, getting a little bit more information out of them. All right. Sorry. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm not sure how this project got in here. Briefly, however, it is a community and recreation center, so I won't dwell on this. This is in the conceptual design phase right now for the town of Cary. Um, next slide. This is a site diagram showing the location of the project at the intersection of 540 and US 1 South. You can see the intersection on the right hand side of the photograph. Um, we're only showing this because this is one of the um, opportunities we've had to engage with the general public and go through the process of the program development to lead us to a building design. The scale is different from yours, but uh, the process is the same. It's getting to the bottom of the needs and the program and the budget and schedule and formulating a, a plan and a design to achieve the final product. Next, please. More images of that project. Next, please. Uh, this is a project underway for the <coughs> town of Holly Springs. It is the Cass Holt uh, park development with a new recreation center. Um, the, the building is in design. It is a four full court, four regulation court basketball um, center used for tournaments. It has um, meeting rooms, community um, uh, recreation facilities, child watch, administrative offices, about a 90 to 95,000 square foot facility. Um, they have a very clear vision of how to serve their community. They did a nice in-depth study that included the, the demographics analysis and budget analysis and site analysis and uh, they really have planned it well and this is going to be a, a great uh, facility. Hopefully uh, start, we'll start construction next year. Uh, next slide, please. A site diagram, one of the early site diagrams, just showing uh, site circulation patterns, not terribly important in this discussion. Next, please. This is a recreation center we did for the city of Raleigh, Marsh Creek Community Center. This was an earlier project, a fairly straightforward program. I think there were uh, two classrooms and a couple of uh, uh, multi-purpose spaces, some admin offices, 
basketball courts and a very nice uh, site development package including a skate park and tennis courts and some other features. This was a, uh, a great example of tailoring the building to satisfy the budget. What you can't see are the economies built into this building. We utilized uh, precast wall panels for the tall gym space, the gymnasium space, so that's a fairly economical building solution. Everything in the green on the left is conventional steel in a rectangular uh, building language that was uh, economically designed. And by utilizing just a few uh, features at the entry and the window treatments, I think we gave it a little liveliness and interest to the building. Next, please. These are interior shots. Uh, we used daylighting along the top of the gymnasium walls uh, to light the, the basketball court area. What you can't see in these photographs is that we imprinted the precast wall panels with images of trees in the forest. It's a beautiful pattern that looks like tree trunks at various angles and thicknesses and widths, and that is spread across the, the wall on the exterior of the building. It's very nice. Again, a very simple treatment that added a lot of uh, interest and kind of harken back to the original site qualities. There's a covered porch that is used a lot for uh, after, after uh, school activities and classes. It's protected from the rain and the sun. This was a uh, not a programmed element in the original program, but due to the site <coughs> topography and the way the building design progressed, this was a, we, we, it's not free, but it was nearly a free amenity space provided to the owner. Next, please. Uh, this is the site plan on the lower right, and these are more images of the building itself and the play structures. Next, please. I'll take it. Okay. Uh, hub participation. We are 50% female in our firm. We have been at that level for uh, quite a while now. It's been 40 to 60 percent. We like the uh, we like the diversity. We have two uh, employees um, from India, uh, one from um, Philippines. We've had uh, a lot of different um, nationalities represented in our firm, and I find it fascinating and enriching. And it really brings a lot to uh, our firm. Beyond that, um, we participate with the local contracting community to assist with uh, hub utilization and during construction and during design. It's a bit more of a challenge in design, but we do what we can to seek out and promote the use of hub and WMBE firms. Um, I think it's a it's in the end of the, at the end of the day, it's a good thing to do for everyone. Next, please. All right, what are we going to do? We're going to make very few promises, but the one thing I will say is, I will never lie to you. You may not like what I tell you, but the bottom line is. I'm going to give you the best professional advice that I can give you. Uh, and, and it may not be popular, and you might not like what I'm saying. These are, these are challenging construction times right now. Cost escalation has been unprecedented in the past two years. Uh, it has leveled off. The increases have not stopped but the rate of increase has slowed. So that's encouraging. I will not make any, <laughs> I will not lead you down a path to where I think you cannot have a successful project. I would rather walk away from a project up front and say, I don't think you can achieve this. I don't want to participate in failure. I'd rather have a good open discussion at the beginning and you tell me your timeline, your budget, and program, and we have an open discussion as to whether 
those three things can come together, right? And usually there's a way. Usually there's a way. And I think understanding the options and uh, and delineating them is is how you get to that end result. All right, that's all I have to say. And I think Bradley. Okay. Hopefully you have questions for us. Questions that Bradley hasn't already answered. Robert, uh, Bradley, I. Uh, Yours and uh, Brandy's presentation was awesome. Your uh, resume is strong. Um, but you put it in here, so I'm going to ask the question. Yes, sir. Uh, I see here where it says legality. Uh, I'm sorry? The legal part of it, Section 6, you put in here? Yes, sir. Um, is these COIs current with the numbers? Your insurance coverage? Yes. There's a current number? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, if you would have had to replace a prime contractor, and I see here on, on liability flagship city insurance, um, are, did these numbers seem low to you? <clears throat> no, and keep in mind, these are these only are for coverage of, of the architecture design firm. None of the contracting element is covered by these insurance policies. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. So you would, the, the, G, the Prime GC, ever how you want to call it, would have their own insurance? They would have to be, have, have to have their own coverage. See to it, and, the, and the values would differ right. substantially. Oh, yeah. 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 yeah, it would have to be. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. Any other questions? Thanks. That's it. Okay. Uh, Thank you all very much. We appreciate the opportunity. <clears throat> Thank you. If you have any follow-up questions, Mr. Hicks knows how to get in touch. Okay. Okay, Mayor, we'll discuss further at a later date, but I think my main objective is if the board wants to move forward on these projects, I think it ought to be your architect, not my architect, not the manager's I'm architect. It needs to be one that you're comfortable with and would look forward to, you know, to work with. Well, I don't know with all the people coming, we can wait forever. And yet, uh, whatever we do, whatever we had talked about before, it will have to be financed out over 30, 35 years. So, anyway. All right. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, very interesting. So, thank you. All right. Uh, next is public comment, and we only have one person signed up, Rhonda Powell from Dunn Street. Uh, come on down. Oh, dear. Um, thank you. Can you... All here. Sure. Okay. Um, my name is Rhonda Powell. Um, I live at 92 North Dunn Street, which is about two blocks from here. And uh, I wanted to touch on two things for you to consider. Um, we've lived in our home since 1996, so our house is almost paid off. So we're excited about that. Uh, we've raised our family here. Now my daughter lives a few blocks down from us, and she's raising her family. So. Um, so we're we're very happy with the environment and um, appreciate everything that you all do. Um, my husband and I have both had health issues the past few years. Um, we have mobility issues, and uh, my husband has he's recovering from a stroke and congestive heart failure. And uh, our doctors have recommended we start a walking program, and so we're building up and walking here and there, and we noticed that, and I don't know if you have any control over it, but the uh, crosswalks by brick and mortar, uh, going across 210 and then going across uh, Broad Street, we, we cannot make it across in time for that to, so I don't know if there's a way that you can add a few seconds to the timing of the change of the crosswalk. I don't know how that works, but if that's possible, we would so appreciate. Um, actually, that I brought that up with, to Jimmy uh, back uh, 
uh, it's like it couple, changes cu- and couple months here that through the I, I have this. You, you're not the only one that has that problem. Okay. Um, okay. Even okay. though I got long legs, I can almost not make it across. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So anyway, just putting that out there. Okay. And the other thing is, um, a lot of times we're we're working up to where we walk from our home to our daughter's home, which is close to the post office. We come up Broad Street, and um, this sidewalk that has been put in years ago that goes to the fire department and then keeps going down Broad Street towards the post office. A lot of people are utilizing it and enjoying it, but there's a lot of trash. Um, sometimes there's people are walking their dogs, they don't clean up after their dogs. And there's only a trash can over by the fountain here. So I don't know if maybe some more trash cans could be put along the route just to, you know, keep things looking nice and pretty. All right. We'll refer those to uh, Jimmy, our facilities manager, and um, so this, you know, see what we can do about that. Thank, thank you, you for much. your and suggestions. Thank you all for your time. Thank okay. you. Just yes, putting ma'am. that out. Thank you. All right. Um, the consent agenda. There are two minutes from December 8th and March the 7th. Is there a motion to approve the, the minutes? I make a motion that we approve the consent agenda. Any other uh, any other discussion? If not, uh, all in favor, raise your right hand. Okay, it's approved. All right. We um, have a public hearing. Um, Randy or Richard, who wants to tell us about that? Good evening. Pleased to uh, be the person to talk to you about that a little bit. Tonight's public hearing has to do with uh, adopting the uh, proposed mobile food vendor ordinance that's included in your packet. Looks a little bit different than the last time you all saw it because it's been codified to match our uh, code of ordinances. I guess you're going to want to call it to order. Well, if you present present your uh, absolutely happy to do so, and then we'll call the uh, the hearing. Picture perfect. Okay, um, you all may recall we had a conversation about this a few months back, and uh, it was determined in, in in house, certainly in our department, that the best resting place for this particular uh, set of uh, regulations is chapter 9 which covers licenses and miscellaneous business regulations Mm -hmm. Um, there was a reserved section that was previously I believe covered taxi cabs but it was uh, article 4 and this is where I've proposed placing this information because it's radically different than the uh, previous chapter which actually has to do with uh, itinerant merchants and peddlers and that sort of thing. This isn't any of those things. This particular set of regulations will not apply to any town. I'm going to move back just a little bit because I feel like the microphone is in the way of where I'm trying to read. But uh, this particular text uh, exempts um, town-sponsored events. So this is not how you regulate a town-sponsored event. And in my mind, what would be happening once these are adopted is that primarily businesses that have room to match this particular set of regulations would make room for uh, a mobile food vendor from time to time or permanently, depending, at least at a six-month interval. Uh, And it would be an accessory use to the primary business. So this would be something to do while you're there. Uh, As I stated when we talked about this the last time, uh, these would be taking place at fixed locations on privately owned property. They would be obtaining a land use permit from our department, stipulating an expiration date for the permit not to exceed six months. And a copy of the permit is supposed to be posted conspicuously at or near the window where the food is vended. Um, Certainly we're recommending that their sanitary grade also be uh, prominently displayed because you certainly need some truth in, uh, in advertising as far as the sanitary practices inside of this food cart 
or food truck or ice cream stand or what have you. Um, the first section where the permit's required basically tells you what we would need to have on file in our office in terms of what it takes to get the permit, the siting requirements, which would explain the best place. You do realize that the vendor themselves can also, uh, as long as they have an agreement to be on the property, can also obtain their own permit. Uh, either one works, but it is for that location. If you want to vend in nine different locations, you need nine different permits. Mm -hmm. This is not a take my permit and go all over town. It's we need to know where it's happening. Good. Maximum of two on each site. And then there's some siting requirements that are listed here. Hours of operation. Um, it was determined that 6 a.m. was as early as this needs to happen and 9 p.m. would be a good cutoff time. If someone feels like they need to work outside of those hours, they would certainly need to get a special use permit because that would allow you all to regulate it a little bit more closely. Um, obviously, there's just one sign that's allowed for the food truck, unless they want to attach something to the truck. We're not going to be having amplified audio, so no, no, uh, no mood, music for the mood. And uh, there's specific requirements for waste disposal, and then the actual permits that you need are listed here, which would be the standard stuff. You need to have proof of liability insurance. You need to have your cart or your truck checked in. Mm -hmm. The one piece that is probably the most poorly understood about f mobile food vending is if you are licensed in the county where you live or your commissary kitchen is, and that county is a different county, say Johnston or mm -hmm. Durham or I give up another county, just pick another county. When you come into this county and you begin to vend, part of the understanding with the health department is that that truck or that place where this food is being vended can be inspected at any time by the Harnett County Environmental Health Department. They are subject to the authority of the local health department, uh, county health department, not town. And uh, let me just say that uh, losing your ability to vend food in another county would of course impact your ability to vend here so all these things part this is sort of like 20 percent law enforcement 25 percent goodwill for the community and uh the remainder is just common sense in my belief okay just want to say you're looking sharp tonight buddy. thank you so I, much i was <laughs> dressing down for this evening <laughs> At least copied your stripes. There you go. What um, this just to clarify, this doesn't have anything to do with like Crepe Myrtle because we're Absolutely we're talking about private property. Private right? property, yes, right? sir. Yep. Okay. Any other questions before we uh, of Randy before we uh, open the public hearing? Yes, Randy. Uh, reading all of this. I Turn your mic on, please. You. Turn your mic on, please. Randy, after reading this, I have like three questions for yes, you. Yes, sir. Um, the first one under Section 9-76, permit required, number three. Yes, sir. Now, I can understand posting the all the information that's required by the county and state. But what are you going to do? Number one, how, who's going to enforce this? Uh, well, actually, this, well, it's sort of a combination. It would certainly start with our code enforcement officer because okay. this is a local code. It, if we... If we ran into a, a an issue that was appropriate for law enforcement, we would certainly call on them to come in and, you know, it depends on what the violation is. But if it's just a simple, and, of course, the food stuff is left up to the county. Okay. You're asking for a state photo ID. Now, what about would, if you got Hispanic workers working in there and they do not have all they have is their uh, ID card? How is yeah. that? The ID card would work as well. These these particular documents are going to be stored in a locked cabinet, and they would only be used for the purpose of if we had some reason to turn the information over to law enforcement. This so is, when you say along with a copy of state-issued photo identification, you think that needs might need to be changed, or, or do you consider the Mexican ID a state? I don't care about it. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, that may be That's an issue question. where it would simply be a, um, let's see, what is it? It says state-issued photo identification or other official ID probably okay. should be added in. Yes, sir. And then what is defined if they're not meeting the requirements? 
Have we well, discussed that? It, yeah, it's very interesting. It's on the back page, and it's very interesting. Dan, Dan did make a point of um, pointing out that um, you have two kinds of potential violations here. You have a parking violation, mm -hmm. which by state law is capped at $50. Mm -hmm. And then you have simply uh, you're violating our zoning ordinance or our uh, code of ordinances. That's a whole different matter. That's $100 for the first violation uh, that doesn't involve parking, $300 for the second offense, and on the third one you are simply, um, your license is revoked and you can't bend here. I would like to, with the, the, uh, with the board, I would like that the police department is involved in this and understands the enforcement part of it because I mean there's going to be I mean you're allowed them to go to nine o'clock at night our code enforcement leaves at five I'm aware you know you're talking four hours there and then some weekends are not here you know that the police department is really really on top of this and can enforce it I don't know how that would go about doing that but are we, could we give the police department the okay to enforce this I don't see why we do it anyway yeah, yeah. Huh? That, that they can do it anyway Tom, I think they could do it anyway, and if they saw something on Saturday night, they could report I'm back talking to the though, code. I'm, I'm talking more of in line of checking the the grade, checking their uh, ID. permit from the county, showing their uh, uh, co um, commissary. What's it word? commissary, making sure the people working in there has proper IDs. Right. Well, that would be sort of a combination thing. Let, let's, let's give a scenario just for about a second, if you don't mind mm -hmm. indulging me. Um, let's say that we had a scenario where clearly a police officer or officers go to the site, they find some violations that are concerning, mm -hmm. not, not immediately threatening, but simply concerning. It uh, doesn't appear to have our, our um, permit visible, mm -hmm. doesn't have identification of the people, uh, refuses to give us the help great mm -hmm. okay that would be an issue where the police would be turning that over to our code enforcement officer but I believe that we would be doing that cooperatively because you're gonna have a couple of agencies involved we would most assuredly turn the complaint over to the health department and require that that be addressed but they, would way. they have the power Randall at that time to shut them down if they don't produce that imp that stuff and we're not tr i guess i don't want people to think we don't want these vendors in town but no, I understand. you know it's a struggle now to keep the restaurants open and i would hate to see yes, you know sir. our restaurants just here every day of the week trying to survive have these people come in and take over and not follow the rules yeah and i, I agree that those are all valid concerns um at least part of this is the hundred foot requirement of right. being away from the other particular piece of it is that I'm going to say that in one other municipality where I've worked, we had the issue of them dumping grease into tree pits, into trash cans where the bags were bursting and right. it was going out on the street. One particular um, town-owned waste can that was metal was set on fire in front of a business and then pushed up under the uh, canopy as sort of a, I don't know, an, I don't like you. So in that particular case, you have arson and you also have the issue of the food truck just being disorderly. So the way we did it there was it was very cooperative as far as the work with, the, of course, the fire department to get it put out. That was mm -hmm. number one. Number two, uh, well, I mean, we would want that put out. And then the second thing was, of course, <laughs> turning it over to law enforcement because, again, if you deliberately set a fire, I, I believe you committed a crime. And then, of course, from the code enforcement piece, it was, I don't even think you need a permit to do this here. So we had sort of a variety of things. We had this other person who kept showing up out of absolutely nowhere uh, a couple of days a month and sort of sliding in. It was sort of a Sunday night to Monday midday. Mm -hmm. And the third weekend that was going on, our code enforcement officer was instructed by me in this other town to go over and say, hey, a couple of things. You don't have a permit. Number two, you're violating an actual ordinance. I need you to see the actual text. And um, within my own office, I'm certainly going to say that uh, I think everybody in the office is involved in the administering of the, the article as well. Okay. Because it's going to be a team effort. All right. It, it says uh, it may be enforced by laws provided in GS 160A-175. Do you have access to that here? Could you check it, please? 
are as provided in this code. Yes. So it does provide um, enforcement yes, um, provisions. It, it really depends on which thing you're doing. Okay. And, and I would suggest, uh, uh, Mr. Price, uh, referencing your question as to our, uh, Section 9-76, a copy of the state issued. Uh, could we say where it says state governmental issued? Yeah, that'd be good. Okay. I just, Mr. Mayor, I just wanted Randall and the chief to know and get with the town manager and make sure that we are. I want to see here because this etc. You got on here all mobile food vendors, food trucks, hot dog stands, ice cream stands, and etc. Yes, sir. Does that et cetera mean people selling tamales out the back of the car? No, sir. That's a completely different matter. Okay. Yes, sir. Right. Well, now, this is essentially a, well, if you simply want to strike, et cetera, I don't mind that. No, I'm just I asking. think, I I think that would be good practice. Okay. Exactly. I just want to make sure the police department is or, doing this. And you might care. say are similar yes, sir. activities. Yes, sir. That makes sense. Yeah. It okay. makes perfect sense. All right. Did you find 160A? I'm trying to pull it up. My internet's not cooperating. Okay. <laughs> But I suspect 160A-175 has to uh, have, provides for penalties, for local ordinances, and our local ordinance has penalties. So, the 160A-175. Yes. yes it says a city, a city, shall have power to impose fines and penalties for violations of an ordinance, and may secure injunctions and abatement orders to further ensure compliance with its ordinances as provided by this section. And our code also provides for misdemeanors and, yeah. and different uh, levels of enforcement. So I think we're, we're probably covered oh, there. But uh, Certainly drawing on the experience of other municipalities, I'm going to say that um, a combination of crimes are I'm, I'm submitted. Go ahead. All right, we've got to have a public hearing on this. Uh, Chief, do you want to? Comment. I just wanted to say, um, it's my understanding any ordinance that the, <coughs> that the board passes, um, if it's uh, someone goes against them ordinances, uh, we can step in and enforce them. That, okay. So this this would fall into place just like the other ordinances, the the parking ordinances and everything else that we have previously uh, passed. That's my understanding as well. Okay. Well, good job, Randall. Well, thank you. All right, let's um, let's open the public hearing. Uh, are there any comments or questions from those in attendance in the audience? Going once? Okay. State your name, please. Mike Hill, 48 yeah. South Park Street. I think y'all getting ready to open up a jar of worms that you, you're not going to be able to uh, keep up with because once you're going to have a couple in here that comply with the rules, then you're going to have others see it and they're going to start parking in every little crook and cranny around this town and uh, you're going to get a lot of complaints. I mean, we've already seen a few of them out here parking in areas. Uh, I mean, I ride to town, Wake County and uh, Hornet County, over in uh, uh, Hidden Valley, parking on the street selling stuff, at the mailbox, selling out of the trunk. Uh, and they had to go in there and just make them all quit because once one started, they all started going in there uh, selling. and uh, and. I just saw one, I don't know if they had permission, but here at the depot over the weekend, over there selling. Uh, there was no function going on, and I, I don't know if they had permission, but they were taking business away from the local restaurants. You know, uh, we got a good, uh, some good restaurants here now, and we don't need to be taking this away from our local businesses. Uh, and every time you take, feed one family, you if they would have, purchased it away from one of our local businesses, and they're paying rent, and they're paying mortgage, and they're paying uh, everything that's required to have a restaurant. And then you're going to let people come in from other counties, come in here and start selling food, and just out of a, I can understand if it's a special fun, uh, uh, 
a function going on into town. But to open it up so they can come in here anytime on a permit and set up and sell food. And uh, remember right down the road here across from Hardy's, that guy set up there and he was there for a month or so. Mm -hmm. Had people stopping on the street. Yep. Uh, and it's going to be hard for the police department to, uh, to get out here and uh, monitor these places unless they get a complaint. And I, I assure you that's the way to get one of them to be monitored is through complaints. Although there are, there's ordinances out here, uh, it's, I just like to reconsider because once you get a few in here, then you won't, uh, just the word's going to get around and they're going to come in here whether they get permits or not. And uh, our town is looking nice and we don't need a bunch of food trucks stuck in every little crook and cranny. You're right. So, Mr. Hill, the problem is nice we, we've had people. Mike, the problem is we've had people come in here and doing it without any permits, without any regulations, and they've already been doing it. And when we seen it, that's when we brought it up to Randall. What can we do about it? I don't know legally if we can stop them unless just, we just say an ordinance where you cannot do it. I mean, we got ordinances on the books for law uh, and laws on the state books, speeding and reckless driving, and they still do it. And but it, it's, to get caught is the, a different thing. But we've had so, vendors here in the last six months doing it without anything, you know, and we're just trying to regulate it. Well, I think it's on the books right now. You can't uh, have a. Well, well we know that, but so they've been doing it. If they've been doing it. Uh, has, has it stopped? They still setting up around here. Okay, let's move on. So just because you get a law and put it on the books don't mean anything. All right. And I guarantee you, you, they won't never be fined. All the years I was here, I never saw too many fines go out unless it was really hardcore violations. So okay. I'm asking you to turn it down. Thank you for your comments. Uh, any other comments? All right, I'm going to close the public hearing. Uh, further comments uh, or questions from the board? Do we have a point right now from, not sorry, uh, for food trucks? No. I think so. If you, if you don't mind, I would like to redirect a little bit. First thing is if you go into the uh, documentation and permit required, number one, the copy of a written agreement or mobile f between the mobile food vendor and the private property owner does not prevent them from renting the space where this is occurring. All we're looking for is written proof that they have permission to be there. Mm -hmm. It's not an unusual practice to charge rent for that. Also, I wanted to point out that <clears throat> If you look on 9.9-77 siting requirements, two mobile fo food vendors at a max located on a private property on a lot or parcel zoned for commercial use only. Residential property is ineligible to be used for mobile food vending. So you're only, re you're literally restricting it to commercial districts. Also, when you start looking at the siting, it, on the surface it seems quite tame until you start looking at the specifics. You have to be located 100 feet from a main entrance to any eating establishment or similar food business, 100 feet from the outdoor dining area operated as a part of any eating establishment. Also, uh, as me measured from the designated location on the lot or parcel accommodating the food truck, 15 feet from any fire hydrant, uh, can't locate in any area of the lot or parcel that impedes, endangers, or interferes with pedestrian or vehicular traffic. And you can't occupy parking spaces that are required to fulfill the minimum requirements of the principal use unless principal uses hours do not coincide with those. The food truck business is being operated, nor shall any mobile food vending uh, occupy parking spaces that may be leased to another business or used to fulfill their parking requirements. Also, the particular case that came to me first was someone parked in the NCDOT right-of-way unlawfully placed on an area where they are an encroachment. 
NCDOT has a variety of ways of addressing encroachment. There's the friendly method where they come up and say, please move. There's also the method that I'm a little bit more used to where you plant one of those sail flags or something in their DOT and they just simply come grab it and throw it in the back of a truck and take it to the same incinerator where they're going to take the rest or the trash dump. Then there's the matter of sending you a registered letter telling you to knock it off. Those are all three. It's, that's a non-technical term. I believe it's cease and desist. That might be the legal term. But nevertheless, I've seen DOT do all three of the above. Generally speaking, DOT's first route is to contact the planning department and say, hey, can you have your code enforcement officer please slide over to this location, stop out front, and notify the person vending food that they are on our right-of-way and they are an encroachment. Mm -hmm. So the matter of food vending in a residential neighborhood is addressed by this. The siting locations, including, oh, you can't be in a handicapped space, you uh, have to have everything that has to do with the food vending within 20 feet of the truck, which is easier said than done if you're using a generator. Please remember, gas generators are quite noisy. Again, if you're going to use my electricity and I'm a business owner, I'm going to want you to have a lease, and I'm certainly going to want you to pay me rent. It's, electricity is not free. So this is sort of a way to maximize the ability for businesses to take advantage of it. Our current ordinance only addresses peddling. Well, this isn't peddling. Uh, itinerant merchant, mm, mm, I don't know, maybe, maybe she might say that's okay. I'm not sure that they are an itinerant merchant. I'm going to certainly say that um, we have a requirement for, um, you know, all those kinds of activities, but the particular issue with it is that we currently require you to put up a $5,000 bond if you're selling furniture or something in that way. This, you're selling me a hot dog or you're selling me a hamburger. There's no $5,000 bond on my hamburger. Uh, so I'm gonna say that peddlers, uh, itinerant merchants, and our other ordinances that are in place right now do not suit this purpose at all, and they certainly don't address it. This is essentially a pop-up restaurant of sorts located on a commercial site owned by a commercial <clears throat> business that has the option of charging rent to the person who's gonna be in their place. So those are some safeguards that are built in. Obviously, we're requesting approval, but uh, you are certainly free to table this matter or address it any way you wish. In, in Randy, in Section 9-77, the siting requirements, number one, says shall be located on private property. Yes. Uh, could you add uh, outside of any street or highway uh, right-of-way? You can do that. I mean, it's it's it's. I mean, private property covers it. That's, I mean, I mean, that's well, public but, property. But you own private property, and it's subject to an easement for the highway, so you technically are still on the private property. So I think we need to, if we don't want them to be on the street, we need to say outside the right-of-way. Tom Murray, I would just say it, I think, Part of the attraction of food vendors is that it gives your citizens choices. Yeah. The thumb also, thumb you will see a lot of times a successful um, vendor at some point in time in a Opens lot of a restaurant. instances yeah. becomes a brick and mortar operation. It's, it is it so. is a test run, <clears throat> and unlike an event where you might artificially have five thousand people here for free. Easter eggs who don't live in the area. Uh, in this particular case, this particular merchant is able to determine the uh, potential clientele based on a longer period of being out there. If you literally cannot sell hamburgers and hot dogs, if you cannot sell tacos in this location, people are telling you they don't want your service. Well, I think I think existing food service businesses are protected by this ordinance yes pretty much because it can't be downtown or uh you know within a hundred feet so um 100 feet's pretty close i mean it's you're you're a ways away and when you factor in the fire hydrants and the handicapped parking spaces and the 99 other things on this list it gets to be very hard to be in a downtown 
Well, I, I, I'm hearing what brought this about. It is, and, and I hear what Mike is saying, this is to stop and limit what is being done. Un, not correctly. These are very confining restraints here. Uh, it's not encouraging anybody to go pop up anywhere down the road here with a, a, a food truck. Uh, and again, saying no more than two. I mean, we have nothing that says basically whether you can or cannot. And I would see, I see this as more of a deterrent to them uh, because if you're, you're not doing it right and you're not doing it with the legal papers and proceedings, you're not going to come in here because we're going to get you. I, I'm looking at it as more of a deterrent rather than an encouraging thing. Mr. Coach, just for the record, I want it to be on the record. I am the one that actually initiated this because of what we were having here without any regulations whatsoever. And I didn't think it was fair to our restaurants and stuff. And I agree with you. I think it's going to be more to deterrent than it is bringing trucks in. Mm -hmm. So, uh, But I am the one that went to Randall about this because I saw it was a nuisance and the way it was being run and handled. Okay. Any further discussion from the board? So the proposed ordinance is in front of you, and we have suggested that in number three of 9-76, instead of state-issued, it should say governmental-issued. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we've uh, said located on private property outside of a highway right-of-way. On a lot or a parcel. Those are the proposed changes. That okay. do you agree to those? One more. There was you, a, you said instead of et cetera on the top line, you'd like it to say similar uh, mobile food. Fitness. Okay. That's the proposal before you. Do I hear a motion? Uh, Hank, now you said uh, between private property and commercial property, or I'm sorry, did I misunderstand that? It was on private property only, or it's on, it's on private property only, but it's oh. commercially zoned private property. Gotcha. Well, uh, it's not residential uh, private property. Yeah, yeah, it can't be residential. Gotcha. Mr. Okay. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion that we approve uh, the mobile food vendors with the proposed adjustments that you've mentioned to uh, okay. planning director. All right. Further discussion on that. Okay. All in favor of the ordinance, uh, please raise your hand. Uh, it's unanimous, Madam Clerk. Okay. Thank you, Randy. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Um, now we're in new business and request for release of bond. Richard uh, Hicks, you want to present that? Okay, back when the board awarded the bid for trash collection services to Carolina Trash Pickup, um, with them being a new firm and you not being aware of what their service levels would be and if they could perform under the contract, you added um, in that contract that they had to provide a bond of $35,000. What the thought was if they didn't perform, you could use that cash bond to help them you know to take whatever action was you know required by the board at that time but uh, Tom they have been in business for several years now they are performing good I think as far as the, the town and the contract Tom is concerned bonds are expensive um, you know we have not had to call the bond so they are asking that the board consider taking that section out of the existing contract now, i think one method of enforcement is that if they don't do the job you don't pay them so i mean you've got some protections and if well, they want to the continue contract, in yeah. business and if they want to continue to perform the service for the down avenger um, then they've got to perform again so and i think the owner is here i don't know if he had any Anything he wants to add? 
Do you have any comment? Uh, we also invested, you know, significant money to put out trash cans. I mean, the trash cans in the town alone are over three hundred thousand dollars. So, um, you know, and it's a it's a ten percent bond of the annual contract. So, you know, if we do continue it, I'll just you know be sent from the town manager what you know ten percent of the contract value would be for the future year. Um, so, you know. Okay. We're here local in Andrew. We work hard to serve the citizens and, you know, do our job diligently each week. Um, you know, there's been minimal calls that we've had to address, you know, if anything, you know, besides a miscan here and there. But as far as not showing up or doing our job, you know, we've. Okay. And will you identify yourself for the record, oh, yeah, please? Sorry. My name is Alex Babbitt. I'm one of the owners of Carolina Trash Pickup. Um, our office is here at 56 East William Street in Andrew. Good. Thank you. Any questions of Mr. Babbitt? Yeah, Alex, uh, we spoke earlier. Um, got the utmost respect for your family and the services y'all are doing. But I do have some questions. Um, if a customer has a complaint, and instead of them calling some of the commissioners, which I have gotten calls, and I've talked to your dad about it, uh, does those calls go into the town or do they go into your office? Um, they're supposed to go to the town and they'll refer stuff to us um, or they can call our office if it's something that will bring to the town's attention so but um, do you have a log anywhere with all the calls that y'all have received since y'all been operating um, no but I could probably put it together pretty pretty easily so um, is it a significant amount <coughs> no sir so and the reference that you're putting you know we never got a call about any issue until you know it was brought to your attention I was on social media so we try and address everything right away. I mean, we pick up, you know, our company picks up my own trash, and I don't tell the guys I live there because I want to see the job they're performing. You know, we try and handle everything accordingly because we wanted to the service to be the level that we'd want at our own house. So, um, you know, unfortunately, it doesn't always make it back to us if there is an issue, and we try and address it very promptly if we are aware of something. So, yeah. Well, my thoughts on it is, I mean, no disrespect. You knew when you were bidding the contract, you had you had to buy the trash cans, yes, or sir. you no, already, had, or you already had to have them. But that was a two hundred thousand dollar cost to y'all. Yes, sir. No, I understand. I'm just I, saying. I know. And then, but this here's costing you anywhere from three thousand to thirty five hundred dollars a year. Yes, sir. For the for this performance bond. Yes, sir. And I kind of agree that you know you've proven yourself. Uh, so. Yes, sir. And our, our thought process is, you know, we do have CPI increases with our contract, but unfortunately, you know, a lot of our costs are out of our control where we can't manage it. For example, you know, the cost of recycling has increased, you know, over a thousand percent from July to now for our disposal costs. You know, we haven't brought it up to the town or anything. We try and just do our job and it is. But if there's somewhere where we can save a couple of dollars to help offset some of these other costs that aren't captured in CPI increases, you know, so that we can continue to keep up with inflation. You know, like with the presentations you guys had earlier, you know, all the costs are out of control as far as, you know, operating expenses, and we're trying to diligently offset them as much as we can. And that's why, you know, you'll see me or my brother or sister out there working very hard to help offset the cost so that we can continue to, you know, operated you know good healthy margins where we can continue to serve the town you know for this foreseeable future well as many customers as you've got i mean you're it's in anything you're going to have hiccups yes sir you know uh but i think it's only fair for the people out there watching it on facebook and the ones in here to know things y'all have done for the town that y'all haven't sent a bill for uh i know y'all helped mr mclean at the ballpark down there uh when he needed help i mean y'all have gone above and beyond yes sir and like when the town ended the uh providing residential dumpsters you know you, the previous provider you know made the town pay a significant fee to get out of that contract and you know we willingly picked up the dumpsters we paid to refurbish them and didn't ask for a penny you know we're trying to be good partners um for a, you know the long term okay any, any further things from the board um, but back to the bond issue, uh, the um, Richard, because this is all kind of new to me. I'm just curious. Uh, do we require bonds with other outside agencies that conduct private business for us? I'm just wondering what the 
procedure or protocol is. I mean, it all depends. I mean, I don't know of any time other you know time normally we're asked for you know for a certificate of insurance. You, you know that names us as additional and sure and everything. Mm-hmm. Contractors when they build buildings, they have to do a, a payment and performance bond and everything. But that's written into the statutes. In this instance, I think the the board was a little un comfortable because they had you know not worked sure. with this organization before no, that's so I mean. I, for me i wanted to know past experience that. how does that work did we have one with gfi i'm not you sure probably wouldn't know not with them. does anybody know i i don't think we did i don't think I we don't did remember. either i mean i'm just curious as to how yeah. this fits in in the cog you know yeah. uh, of what normal procedure is in doing that i mean i get it and, i understand why it was put there because it was a new business and firm for us and just wondering how it operates so yeah if you i'm just yeah and if you you know i'm just saying you're gonna call a bond doesn't mean you're gonna call a bond i mean sure you know and it's a very extensive process yeah, the, I'm sure the, you know the bonding company is gonna fight you the, the you know the person to sure. pay for the bond isn't gonna give it up that easy i mean so it's you know it is not a very um easy method to you know to enforce some type of action against the company as you said earlier it's easier just not to pay them yeah. <laughs> okay uh let's see is there a motion we got did you make the motion yeah, i'd like to make a motion that the uh we release the uh we uh, honored a request for the release of the bond for thirty five thousand dollars to uh carolina trash okay any further discussion can I make one comment? It's um, it's technically ten percent of the annual contract value, so it's not just thirty-five thousand. It, it changes, so I don't know if it technically if that would you accept that change? Yes, sir. Ten yeah. percent of the annual contract value. Okay. All right. If no further discussion, uh, all in favor of uh, Mr. Price's motion, uh, please raise your hand. It's unanimous. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank for you for your Thank service. You. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Hans Kalwitz, budget amendment number seven. We still got a lot of stuff to to go, so mm-hmm. give us the high points. I told Hans if I did this, he hadn't gone far enough. Okay, well you're a good man, huh? That, uh, that yeah. That did happen, and I told him I, I did relay that I will keep that in my peripheral. So okay, just proceed. All right, here we go. All right. <laughs> so, uh, all right. This is typical. Last fiscal year, we've had a budget amendments just like this, uh, at least two or three, and so here we are again. We have a, a budget amendment here, and we we know essentially what this entails and what it is is it, first off let it be known that this is a balanced budget guaranteed uh, the and it is to of course most certainly it's to uh, meet the expectations of the auditors to uh, ensure that the audit is uh, smooth and it helps us prepare ourselves for the budget process it's important so allow me to delve just a bit in and then keep it short concise brevity that's what I seem to understand the word that keeps coming to me yep so the this budget amendment it in essence has elements of just simply revenue that was not expected that we need to increase allowable spending. And then, uh, for the most part, of course, uh, it is, so to speak, I'll find another terminology for this, but cleaning house. Uh, or at least, at least the, the, again, one of the first stages of cleaning house. As, as is, writ- is uh, written here, uh, it, the police department has been very aggressive with grants. Very aggressive, beautiful in fact, really, truly. Uh, and we should be proud of that. Uh, also, uh, the ABC, I'll call education program. We are making sure to restrict that revenue. 
uh, and so thereby increase the allowable spending specific to that program within the PD department. One uh, very, very uh, wonderful thing that the Planning Inspections uh, Director had requested and the uh, Planning Inspections Department has been doing is nuisance abatements. And so, you know, what the desire was, was to go ahead and s just singularly capture uh, the revenue received from nuisance abatements, which is something that most certainly the planning and inspections director can speak on far greater than I could, uh, yet still something, to my understanding, is something to be proud of. And so a new revenue line was created, and then thereby a new expenditure line within the planning and inspections department was created as well. So there, there's that. That's what this budget amendment, you know, has to do not entirely with. What the rest uh, of this budget amendment has to do with just simply <coughs> between departments and whatnot, getting all of the expenditure lines in order, line item by line item, so that at least, again, to be redundant, cleaning house, getting ready for the audit, and getting ready for the budget. Okay. Uh, so that's the uh, crux of it, and... Uh, it, we're keeping it short, true. Right. I understand that. Although, we have extensive uh, material on this in our materials. Anybody yeah. have any questions? Nope. Okay. Is there a motion to approve budget amendment number seven? I make, I a, make motion. a motion to uh, approve budget number seven. Okay. Kaz, um, any discussion? If not, all in favor, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Okay, <laughs> it's unanimous. All right, Thanks. move on, hands to uh, Hans to the next thing. I didn't get the cut button, did I? <laughs> uh, that, uh, so, so the next thing, of course, uh, what was due to our what I call budget retreat, I guess board retreat, what I call it, what you will, and and that has to do with the topic of the town, whether the whether we should absorb the credit card. Uh, surcharges, fees, whatnot, mm -hmm. so on and so forth. And to my understanding, it, it was unanimous that the town should Ask pass them. along the expense. Uh, who isn't doing that these days? And we've seen the cost to the town if we were to fully absorb that expense. The contract before all of us today, which I don't have with me, the, that contract uh, is and will be in accordance to a certain general statute that we, in, in which we uh, as a municipality uh, will make ensure to abide by. Uh, and it cannot uh, reach a cap of, uh, or there is a cap or of 4% uh, as far as you know, charging a customer. But at the end of the day, and I, it's always good to know, and I, fairly confident that we would all agree with this, that you, you would say it, it's that cost, please. Your time just to get to town hall, the gas, your time, put a value on your time. I'm, I am fairly confident that we would all agree that that would far exceed the expense for the convenience or whatever you would like to call it fee. So that is the contract, and the desire simply is whether the uh, board were to be so willing to continue to move forward with this or scrap it. Here we go. I think the actual fee would be about three and a half percent. Yeah, that's what I think. And if you notice last, you know, um, our absorption of the fees is is up to about fifty some thousand dollars per year. Yeah, I wanted to point out to the public, we are losing a lot of money here. Right. Losing it for no reason. And if you want the convenience of putting it on a card, yeah. you should have to match that. It's not. It's done everywhere. I'm just assuming well, that we are doing the amount only to recoup what it cost us. Making it clear that we're not doing this to make any money. It's just to cover the cost. That's the one clarification I want to be sure is true. Is this you either pay it or the customer 
pays it. If the town pays it, you know, to, as I mentioned, it's costing us over $50,000 yeah. per year. If the customer pays it, there will be about a 3.5% fee. But we will only be it. using the amount that the company charges yes. us. Yes. We will not be doing it more no, and trying to make any money off of it. it. We're just trying to cover the cost of it completely. Yes. Want to clarify that? Yeah. Because yeah. most businesses are doing it now anyway, so we need to fall in line with that. Are there any ways of payment that would not incur the fee? Well, certainly cash or check payment mm -hmm. at the town hall. Yeah. Yes. What about... Um, um, Online payment. If you use your credit card or your debit card, well, you will pay the fee. Uh, what about a draft on a checking account? An ACH bank draft would not have okay. a fee to it. All right. So there are ways around it. Yeah. Okay. Well put. Is there a motion? I'll go ahead and make the motion that we pass this. Okay. Any discussion? All right. All in favor of Kaz's motion, uh, please raise your right hand. And it's unanimous. Okay. Thank you, Hans. Thank you. Good. Good job. Thank you. I, thank you. I'm just. I'm just. I'm just playing with you. Okay. All right. Uh, okay, Richard Hicks. All right. Request. Chief Thompson's brought you on before the proposal to build a training center right at our firing range uh, we would like to, to move forward with that project um, using three sources of funding they currently have seventy eight thousand dollars in their asset forfeiture fund um, we have the fifty thousand dollar grant from the general assembly that came through uh let's see harnett county and um, we're also asking to use 25 thousand dollars from the Andrew ABC profits distribution time um, they gave us some additional funds this month um, the ABC board cannot tell you how to spend your funds they just have to send it to you and it goes into the general fund so okay. in order for those funds to be used for this it has to be approved by the town board okay um, so we're asking you to you know to allow us um, to, to use twenty five thousand dollars of those ABC distributions, which will give them about um, one hundred and fifty three thousand dollars to move forward on this project. So the essence is the uh, authorization to move forward, and secondly, to use the twenty five thousand from the ABC profit distribution. Yes, sir. Um, and the other two funds. Well, and and the other two. Yeah. But, I mean, the other two were were basically authorized, but at any rate, to use all the money. To build mm -hmm. it. Okay. Is there a motion? I'll make a motion. Okay. That we approve it. Kaz has made the motion that we allocate the hundred and fifty three thousand uh including twenty five thousand from the Andrew ABC profits distribution for a fire and range mm -hmm. training center. Um any discussion? Yes, motion should be Right. Yes. I think you included In the actual agenda report. It says twenty-five five on the yes. I'm, yes, list so I'm just here. reading it. it like, yeah, twenty-five five. five. Okay. So we're okay. asking for the okay twenty-five. So one fifty-three five hundred. Um, yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. One fifty-three five hundred. You accept that, Cass? Yes, sir. All right. <clears throat> Any further discussion? All in favor, please raise your right hand. Okay, it's unanimous once again. All right, um, Chief, move move on. Um, <coughs> all right, shop with a cop. <laughs> Thank y'all for that. Um, Andrew Police Department would is wishing to get approval to est establish shop with the cop program. I'm sure several of y'all have heard of that. Hornet County um, Sheriff's Office does it. Mm -hmm. um, Dunn Police Department does it. Several agencies are doing it now. And it's to provide and support needy children around our community. Um, we're going to be working hand-in-hand -hand with the schools, local school 
um, and they're going to help us as far as picking the child, uh, the, the children, and then we're going to take them shopping sometime in early December to give them something to open up on Christmas Day. It's something that we're wanting to go ahead and get established. Um, the funds that will be collected um, will have no financial impact on the town. The project will be financed through tax deductible donations. And I'm just asking for y'all's approval. I think it's a great idea. Any discussion from the board? Is there a shot with a cop motion? I'll make the motion. Okay, one cop. more time. Okay. <laughs> shop with a cop program as outlined by the chief. Yes. I'd like to also say uh, I'd like to be the first one to donate that house hundred dollars my wife write the check for the house. Can't take it until July first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the funds that will be donated we're we're gonna start trying to get donations um when the physical year starts. So and then that way we'll come back and see you July first. <laughs> I think, Lee, that's a good thing to point out to those people that are listening. Yes, this costs us nothing as the town. The only way that this program will work is if citizens and businesses uh, donate to the fund to make this happen. So it is a donation-driven thing. So, you know, please help out the program. That's the only way it's going to work. Oh, I'll match you. Absolutely. Yeah. All of it. <laughs> uh, what is any objection by the board okay come forward hi i'm dolores price um and i just wanted to point out that uh to make a child smile uh was a program that was here in andrew that did a very similar thing disbanded this year after 20 years yes i'm sorry it's not quite 20 it's ap over 10 um, and so there is a need now. There is very much a need to make a child smile, do the same thing, collecting donations and taking a busload of children to shop um, with, to be able to have something to open up uh, for Christmas. So perfect timing, couldn't be better. And I know. Um, the Rotary Club has donated to that before. So along with the Price household, the Rotary Club will be behind it too. Right on. Thank Very you. good observation. Thank you. I'm the mayor. I would add, um, since I've been here, Tom, I have stressed to the partner heads, I don't want them out there raising money or moving forward on projects like this without prior board approval. Right. Um, so right. that you know what's going on. Okay. The motion is before you. Um, all in favor? Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna come and see you, Curtis. I've already got okay. one. I've okay. already got one printed out for you. <laughs> he's he's absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Excellent. Thank there. you, sir. Thank you. All right. Uh, all in favor of the motion, please raise your right hand. <clears throat> it's unanimous. One more time. All right. Thank y'all again. Um, I'm gonna stay up here just a few more minutes. Okay. All right. Um, we're Andrew Police Department is wishing to partner with Royce Publications in reference to designing and producing 300. And I've got a typo here. It's 2024. Um, Andrew Police Department calendars to be able to provide for our local businesses. Um, and again this is no financial impact to our town um the same company and I, I i put some papers in the packet the same company provides the service for gardner police department fuquay police department and hornet county sheriff's office um i was i was privileged to be introduced to them when i went to the chief um, conference this past year and was highly impressed with their work um, so, so ads pay for it yes. is that the deal okay so I, I'm I'm asking y'all's permission to be able to move forward with the partnership. Okay, is there a uh, policeman of the month picture? <laughs> <laughs> I, 
<laughs> you didn't see that coming, did you? I just we got a picture of the chief wearing one of Han's little hats. <laughs> on there. Okay, well, enough of that. All right, clean. keep it clean. Okay, um, is there a motion? So all we have to do is approve the program. And something else I did want to throw in. Um, this company is actually going to provide us $1,000 just for allowing them to um, do this for us. And um, okay. and we're going to take that money, as several of you are aware, last year was the very first time Andrew Police Department has ever had a Christmas party. So we're going to take that $1,000 and apply it so we can uh, use that toward catering or whatnot. Okay. If it's approved by the board if at a later date. If it's approved by the board. Well, we could approve it right now, couldn't we? I don't see why not. So is there a motion to approve the the project and including using the $1,000 for a Christmas celebration for the I uh, make a motion to authorize the approval and move forward with that is partnership. Is there discussion? If not, all in favor, please raise your right hand. It's unanimous. Okay. Good enough, Chief. Thank you. All right. Uh, Randy, street striping. We've been talking about this a long time. Yeah, I, I'm trying my luck again tonight. I'm up, up here for my second time at bat. Okay. And we have a nice visual, which was included in your packet. Um, this request is strange. Uh, DOT came to us probably a little over a month ago and said, we want to make the section in front of First Citizens Bank better. And so they gave us three options. And um, I've had these highlighted so I can show you the three options. And they would like this board to vote tonight and make a recommendation as to which one of these three configurations. What is that diagonal line at the left that, bottom? That, that, I'm sorry. That, oh, oh, Explain it, Lucy. Okay, talking about this thing here. Uh, yeah. This would be where, let's see, what is that? Hold on a minute. Okay, so what happens in the first diagram, and it's the one I like the least, is you retain the two parking spaces in front of First Citizens that are, I think there's currently three maybe, but there's <coughs> going to be two in this particular illustration. Mm -hmm. This uh, line indicates the, um, <laughs> the direction that traffic takes. So you start out in, in one lane configuration there at the intersection. It suddenly blooms into two, which is a little odd. Um, so basically both, both both, basically you're creating, well, what looks like about five lanes out of what is currently two lanes. Mm -hmm. Okay, my concern is just about where that diagonal line is because I feel like that's where the accident's going to happen. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't like this one. Uh, not my favorite. I understand preservation of on-street parking, but I think you'll notice that there's a great <coughs> deal of off-street parking beside First Citizens Bank, and I believe that this is not helping matters. What is that dark thing that that diagonal line is crossing? It appears to be the shadow of the building. Oh, that is, okay. Yeah, yes, sir. That's what it is. <laughs> okay. It's Batman. The shadow. But, uh, okay. Yes, it, it's, it's just a tall building. This is apparently a very bad lighting situation. If we we'll go to the second one, I'm afraid I'm going to have to tip my hand and tell you I'm a little bit uh, more in favor of this one. Where you see those little cross cut X's, they're going to take out lines. So you would come in, yeah, okay, so basically you're removing the parking spaces in front of First Citizens. You have truly two lanes that become three, okay? So if you're in the straight lane down at the intersection of Broad and you are heading across, you are, you are I'm just feeling like I have to have a pointer. Yeah, you I'm going to attempt the pointer. How dare you. Okay, we're gonna see if I can do this. I have no confidence. Oh good, gracious, it does work. Okay, so basically on this particular side, the straight lane stays straight all the way heading up to 10. The right lane, which actually starts 
technically in front of Red Barn. You can either turn into Broad or you can go straight on down here and make a right onto the street in front of us right here. If you are turning left, uh, you start out in this lane which splits into two here. One is a dedicated left and the other one is a dedicated straight. What is currently in place uh, where parking spaces are on this side of the street, you come in, you have one lane until you get here where it becomes two. You are either going straight or turning left or you're turning right. If you're turning right, it's a dedicated lane. One, right, of, one of the problems uh, right now is that if you want to turn left, the traffic in the straight lane is backed up so far you can't get can't to the left. Right. Lane. Yeah, they, they swear this is going to help. I don't think so. <laughs> okay, let's, let's go on. Well, they're going to remove some of the, the, the striping, and we're either going to have spaces or no spaces. But this one is officially my least favorite in the bunch. Um, this particular one creates a situation where you have one lane that becomes two almost, well, three actually, almost immediately. Uh, so you either get to go straight, you get to turn right, or you get to turn left. This lane that starts over by uh, Red Barn kind of consistently stays one until you get to directly in front of the bank where it suddenly splits out into two and then eventually becomes a third. I don't see that stacking right there as terribly helpful. I think it would accommodate about three cars. So if more than three people are turning left, we're still sitting there stacked up and it's jammed. This striping is proposed to happen following the uh, resurfacing of uh, in C210, but they were supposed to be sending, um, I believe they were described as professional quality illustrations. Uh, they managed to, yes, I know. So they managed to lose those illustrations and this ballpoint pen rendering came to my desk, which I decided last meeting was a confusion um, source and I didn't want to go there, but of the three options, Veronica, if you can go down to the second option, yeah. All right, of the three, this is the one that to me makes the most sense. You sacrifice parking spaces on both sides of the road, which seems very democratic in nature. You are literally not party politics, democratic like our government is. Uh, it's very much a democracy. So you're going straight here. You're either turning left, which that's six or seven cars as opposed to three. And uh, yes, of course, these people are down to one, but when it makes sense, it suddenly becomes two lanes and you're either turning left or you're turning right, or you're going straight. Question, sir. And you're also stacking up more cars in that right-hand lane, yes. than right turn lane that you can't nail. The, yes. The bottom lane where in the lane above it, you t certainly suddenly turn down into the bottom lane. Why can't that area underneath, oh, yes. The red Thank you. yes, sir. No red way. button. I don't see a red button. Oh, there it is. It's, yeah. yeah, there you go. All right, what's wrong with that right there? No, this is the one I like. What's wrong? I mean, why can't the traffic use that area right there to go straight le left? I mean, to go left. Oh, as, you mean and drop do, it down to one? Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Basically, the Good idea point. here is to try to make a what is currently about a two-lane road mimic uh, a three- or four-lane road. There is no option where they can remove sidewalk or get rid of right-of-way. That's, that's not one of the options. Excuse me. Okay. Ordinarily, what you, what you would do... What you would do ordinarily is you would just widen the road. That's, that's not an option. Um, I think re-timing those two stoplights would be helpful because the stacking situation is horrific. I've tried that. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to work. Help. Okay, no. well, this, this doesn't work. It, well, the, the current configuration is, is bad. But essentially, as um, the interim manager uh, pointed out, uh, the current situation is that a lot of cars that are going to be turning right would definitely benefit from being able to get in the right-hand turning lane and go an entire block. Because right now, those people are just holding everyone up. So you're okay. talking about doing away with the parking right there by the bank then, they, uh, they, on the road? Yes. They literally were in favor of removing all the, paint, the parking on both sides of the street. It was just, which way is it going to happen? Right. I was told prior to your last meeting that they were sending an option where all the parking spaces were being removed. We're just doing it DOT style. They're just gone. Well, then they came up with the, wouldn't it be better if you all chose? <laughs> okay. Uh, yes, sir. sir, why can't the 
I'm pushing it. Why right can't button. it's not working now? Why can't the traffic from Lillington go straight where the parking is? As opposed to turning to the right, you're talking about the top lane. Gosh, I wish this would work. Bottom lane. Oh. If you're heading, if you're st driving straight on 210, you go through the traffic light. Yeah. Where, where it bumps okay. up there. Okay. Yeah. Why can't he traffic said, why from can't Lillington that just be straight, go straight? And you use that they line. Can. You know, I almost feel like yeah, that's for a, more that, stacking. Yeah, I think that would be a great DOT question. Would you like us to send in that? And, and that way, you wouldn't be caught up with all this traffic in the straight lane, and have to wait until that goes forward to get over to the turn lane. They had absolute clarity of mind when they were talking about getting rid of parking spaces in front of Red Barn, but for some reason, this particular intersection seems to be frustrating. Well, I mean, getting rid of parking places is not a popular thing, but I'm golly aware. gee, waiting in line for a traffic light isn't either. I, 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 is it going to happen regardless? Their intention is to restripe the street no matter what. The we asked is, them to do it many years ago. Yeah, well, they're finally getting around to it. I just don't agree. I don't. I don't. I don't. We've got a worse traffic situation than we do parking situation. And we're uh, the bank the has its own lot right there to the side to lose those few in front of that bank. The par the traffic situation is horrible, and losing a few parking spaces to fix it, I think, is a big trade-off. Uh, they're not going to do anything else. They're not going to give us another stoplight. They're not going to help regulate. They made all of that very clear to us, but yet they don't have to deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. And as you said, all it takes is one person wanting to turn, and they have blocked traffic, back to the other end of town and let's not lose the point that we are building parking oh yes lots right two of them and parking lot and parking lot by the farmers market so any parking spaces we would be losing potentially will be gaining, gaining. elsewhere thank you yeah, which is why i felt safe in saying okay i'll bring this in honestly if he had asked me do you want to bring three pictures and ask for a vote i would have said no i just want you to show us the picture of what you're going to do and let's just move on so no, there are did. four lanes at the uh, 55 intersection, right? M more yes. or less, there are, they are creating four lanes, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay. So back up the street, are there still four lanes? In a way, there's one. Yeah, there. Yes. yes. Honestly, this is mm -hmm. what happens when you take what is essentially <coughs> two lanes with some parking on the shoulder and try to convert it into four lanes, but you want to do it in a way that hopefully is going to enhance the traffic situation. Of the three options, the middle one is the least frustrating to me and makes me feel less like I'm going to be hit head on. So this is the one that you... B, B is the second one is the one I would recommend. Although I'm not averse to asking them additional questions. And just, just so that there's maximum range usage for going both directions. <clears throat> With the stacking put in a way that you don't get hit while it's happening. And and so you don't have to wait for traffic in another lane to get into your lane. Yeah, it's it's a fun place to be. It is. So basically we're going to be doing away with the parking in front of the bank right up here and across the street. Yeah. That that is that is their intention, yes sir. Okay. Okay. Which I would have preferred they make a lot clearer earlier on. <laughs> yeah. It would have made this speech better. I, I see where you're going. With well, that, yeah. I think this is the poorest excuse for a diagram that I have ever seen. <laughs> a, a, a junior high kid could have done better than this. Uh, I, I'm really disappointed. I'm glad they're going to do something, but this is rather confusing and embarrassing. Um, it's highlighted because it was illegible before. It was essentially ballpoint pen on a aerial. Sure. Well, this this is actually 600 uh, percent. Enlargement. You do understand the actual full thing was about two blocks, and I looked at all three pictures and said, I don't see anything at all. So, Randy, can you answer? No, I see it. There's a left turn. Mm. Mm. Okay, yes. I, I can see now at the right there. end when you are just, you've just passed the depot, you have a left turn lane, you have a straight lane, and a right-hand lane. 
coming into the other side. You only have one until it blooms. Until into it two. blossoms up there. Uh, right. Because it's not a big long block. Because there's a right turn lane adjacent to the, um, well, uh, to turn on the Broad Street there. Yes. To make a left hand turn. That's uh, one question I got because it's showing here that the uh, right hand turn lane. It's just the right-hand turn lane. Why didn't, can't they just make the right-hand turn lane a straight and the right-hand turn lane? Because you can make a right turn on red where the left turn lane is going to I be traffic. Having sat in that situation the day before yesterday, I have to say it was not my favorite way to spend 25 minutes. You're going to have more access right there. People turning to the left going down yep. 210 with that tight area there. Because basically now they're running on the where cars was parked there coming from like you know, Ace Hardware taking a left. But anyway, Mr. Mayor, if it's okay with you, I'd like to make a motion that we approve option number two. The the middle one? Yes. yes. Uh, subject to clarification. As yes, sir. Uh, yeah. That yeah. would be a, a good thing. I, mean, I would suggest you say that option two is your favorite option, but you would like to see a final detailed drawing. Right. Yeah. Not so much a drawing as a rendering that we can actually <laughs> see on the wall. That we can understand. Sense. When when do they need it done by? We didn't get I don't think they're going to pay 210 until this summer or right. uh, late Okay, so we've got summer, time. So we've got All right. Time. Okay. So Zero. please request of clarification. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a, so there's a motion that we approve that subject to clarification by DOT. All in favor of that, uh, please raise your right hand. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for All your right. kindness. I'll see you later. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, says the town clerk, Ms. Hardaway, is next. We received a voluntary annexation petition that was submitted by G&J Development, LLC. Um. So if the clerk would like to direct me to look into this further um, and investigate the sufficiency of the petition. Um, this area is located at 5963 NC210. That is approximately 28.35 acres. Okay, now this is not approval of it. Uh, it's simply directing the clerk to investigate whether the petition is a is correct correct okay is there a motion i move to direct the clerk to investigate the sufficiency of annexation petition submitted by j and g development llc for 28.35 acres all right straightforward all in favor please raise your right hand okay done all right moving right along at last, we get to advisory board interviews and appointments. Y'all have been waiting breathlessly, I'm sure, for that. So, uh, Madam Clerk, tell us what's going on. Yes, sir. We have one um, available vacancy that is on the Community Development Committee. Um, and this would be fulfilling the remaining term of a former member that would end December 31st of this year. <laughs> And we have three applicants, um, Jordan Phillips, okay, um, Chris Donovan, no, Jillian Knowles, okay, um, Jordan is here tonight. Is that the only one who's here? Yes. Okay. All right. Jordan, come tell us about yourself. Thank you for having me, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of the board. Uh, my name is Jordan Phillips. I live at 3117 Maranca Drive. It's Johnson's Landing across from the airport. Um, I've lived in Andrew now for about three years. I moved here in 2020. Uh, I'm active duty military. I'm a soldier at Fort Bragg. I'm nearing the end of my career, and so we decided to find a forever home. We picked Andrew. So Yay. This is where we're going to stay for the, for the duration. So uh, I'm a special operations soldier. My specialty is civil affairs which is a uh, facet of special operations where we go to foreign countries and we assist uh, both local nationals there, local government, and help them interact with the United States Army as a whole. Uh, I'm originally from uh, 
town about half the size of Anger in Iowa, in Grundy Center, Iowa. Uh, I've been in North Carolina since 2005 when I was first stationed at Fort Bragg. And uh, I'm a graduate of uh, North Carolina State where I got my master's degree in education. So it's a little bit about me. Thank you for your service. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes. How does a master's degree in education fit you for this? Well, uh, <laughs> I saw the ad for this on the Facebook page, the town Facebook page, and I thought it was a good chance for me to get involved with my local community. Uh, so I thought I'd just throw my name in the hat and let it, let it see. As far as my master's degree, it, it uh, you know helped me think critically and it's helped me uh, expand my ways of thinking in a lot of different uh, fields. So. <clears throat> okay. Questions from the board? Oh. <laughs> 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 so, Chris, do you know exactly what the planning, I mean, Jordan, sorry, do you know what the planning board does? Uh, I don't know exactly what the planning board does. <clears throat> yeah, oh, oh, sorry, the community <laughs> development the community board. Devo no, the community development board. Um, no, I don't know exactly. I, I take it from the name that, it, that volunteers help give input into the development of Andrew. You sort of got the gist of it there a little bit. I'm, I'm very hard on people, and they will tell you this, who come in here and just want to serve on some board and have not gone to any of their meetings or scoped out with the leader of that uh, in, in the department of the town to go to them and say, what is it that this board does, and, and get more information about. I, I understand the w desire to want to be involved. I just am sometimes a little hard on researching what it is that you want to devote your time and energy to um, because they are they are the planning group that heads everything off at the pass before it ever comes to us. They are sort of like an advisory type board to, to look at all of these rezonings and, and the rules and regulations and things that go with it to come and they make a recommendation to us. Now they don't they don't finalize or they don't have a say in it, but they send information to us and advise us what they have scoped out in the beginning. And that's as far as zoning and, and things. But, I mean, businesses in town is the big encouragement of that group. We want new, as an advisory board down there, and I was talking about the planning board. But your uh, the biggest thing is developing and researching how can we lure and develop businesses that already exist. How do we help them? But how do we broaden that scope and, in, and invite more people in? And how do we lure them? How do we encourage them? Incentives, uh, things of that nature. So, yep. Well, Jordan, thank you so much for showing up tonight. You, you <laughs> well, absolutely. Your, you, you stuck your head on the chopping block, and we appreciate that you took the interest in uh, putting your name out there. Um, I like to make the motion that we go ahead and approve the appointment of Jordan Phillips. Can I ask one question before you do? I, yep, I got go your ahead. we got your motion. Yes, we, we can take did, that as discussion. Yes. Did we hear anything from these other applicants as to why they did were not, or did they let you know they would not be able to be here tonight, or they just didn't appear? No. Okay. Okay. Just wanted to know that question so, there as well. Thank you so much for showing up. <laughs> My motion still stands. Okay. Any further discussion? Mr. Jordan, have you, uh, Jordan, Mr. Phillips, have you met Casey, our community developer? I have not yet. Okay. Uh -oh. He's over there in the yellow. I said you'd be working with her. You'll be working with her. <laughs> All right. All right. You ready to vote? Yes. All in favor of the motion, please raise your right hand. Okay. It's passed. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you for being interested. Okay. All right. Okay, next. Hans is back. Oh, no. You didn't see that coming, huh, Hans? We have worked through a lot of stuff tonight. Folks, thank you so much for your patience and being willing to participate. We have to deal with... Um, uh, the finance director's uh, contract for auditing, right? Yes, Mr. Mayor, that is correct. So there are two um, 
there's an engagement letter and a, then a contract. What's the at difference? The end, at the end of the day, it's just a formality. One gets sent, <laughs> one gets sent to the LGC, and the other one gets uh, is more or less an agreement between the municipality and the the firm. Uh, so again, it's formality. We've been there now. This will be the the third year that we've been with them. Successful, I would say so, considering certain limitations and whatnot and so on and yada yada. And so we have a strong rapport and reciprocity with them. We, it's been very good. And every year they've changed who uh, looks at our books. That's a good thing. That's a very good thing. Changes things up just a bit. Different perspective, different questions. And they comb through our books Thoroughly. Okay. Well, Mayor, I think you, the actual cost of the audit for next year would, would be $26,000, but I think you could approve the engagement letter and the audit contract in a single motion if you want to. That's what I was going to ask. Uh, so <clears throat> is there a motion to improve the engagement letter and the contract? Hon Mr. Mayor, before we go there, Hans, if, if I can ask, sir, uh, is that okay? Yes, go ahead. Uh, you've had success with them for three years, and that's, that's that's great. But a lot of that depends on what y'all do. I mean, they review it. They're not doing the work for you. But uh, do we ever price it out with anybody else to see if we can get someone? To, you know, do we ever price it out? That is the intention after this audit. Okay. We do have a three-year contract with them. Okay. So we don't have a choice. Yeah, we put it out every three years. Good point. Good point. We really don't have a choice. Well, this would be the do, third year. It, yeah, makes sense. It yeah, I got you. Right, okay, you thanks. Uh, clarify that. One of the um, biggest issues statewide right now is there are not enough audit firms to do local government audits. Oh, okay. Um, so you're finding a lot of towns being one, two, three years behind on the audit to end up on the um, um, bad list. LGC watch list. Yeah. We don't need motion. that. We've had good a good rapport a with them, haven't we? we did. No, yes, sir. Yes, they're yes. good firms. We need a motion, right? Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to adopt and execute the engagement letter with Thompson Price, Scott Adams Company, and PA, and also the engagement letter with Thompson. Well, the contract. Well, the contract with Thompson Price, Scott, and Adams. Twenty-six thousand. Yeah. For thirty-six thousand. Twenty-six. Right. Yes, twenty-six thousand. Twenty-six thousand. I mean, you can give them a. Bonus. No, 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 no. <laughs> Further discussion on this? Not all in favor, please raise your right hand. It's passed unanimously. All right. Okay. Folks, we have been through a passel of stuff, as we used to say down east. And I commend the board for working through this stuff. Thank you. Thank you very thank, much. Thank, thank all right. Um, Okay, manager's report. I don't have anything, Mayor. Okay. Um, it, we have, uh, in light of the hour, we have the reports and the record uh, from anybody, but uh, if you would like to add anything, uh, just raise your right hand. <laughs> okay, guys. Uh, for yes, for the record, to, there was some resistance over there. I did want to draw your attention to one item on ours. It's that new suit he's wearing. There's one item I did want to draw your attention to. In our code enforcement report, I wanted to point out to you, in addition to the total collected of $200 this month, if you drop down to the nuisance at 383 West Church Street, not only was it demolished, but we fined them $700, and they paid three days later. So we collected a total of 900 this month wow. on code mm -hmm. enforcement, in addition to the um, 19000 on building permits, which brings us very close in building permits to 94%. Okay, cool. Thank you. All right. Yes, Randall, since you're up here, I do have a question for you. I responded to an email with you all this week, you and the manager, and I think maybe the commissioners. 
in regards to the breakdown of the report from yes, your code enforcement officer. When I received my package from the town manager, it was not in there. So can we make sure going forward that we get it up here on the board so we can see every – his call log, please. Yes, sir. Not a problem If that's at all. okay. I received mine, so I don't know why you didn't yeah. receive yours. I did not get mine. You got it? You just threw it away. No, I didn't either. I went through it like a mile through. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Just, Thank you for your indulgence. All right. And you all have a good evening. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So Anything else there. from the managers? Uh, yes, I'd like to speak to Jimmy. Yeah, I got it. Well, I believe Lee came forward first. Oh, okay. Anybody else? Uh, Jimmy? Jimmy you, wanna, you had a question. Can I have a quick question for Lee? I, I know you're going to, I could have asked you this separately. Um, again, I'm looking on this sheet, and can you tell me where I'd be looking? It says traffic stops, 158. Where would I look for written citations? It's, um, you've got, the, can you hear me? I can. You've got the traffic citations, then you have total charges from those traffic citations, which is right beside of it, and then you have the number of verbal slash uh, written warnings right beside that. Where is it? And above that on the line prior, you have the... Um, the city ordinance violations. Is there another page? That's something I try not to discuss on Facebook Live. No, but no, I I, I had asked to see it, and I yeah. would just want you can show yeah. it to me later because we're still not seeing it on here. So you can just come and show oh. it to me. I guess we're looking at two different places. You you can just do that later. Yeah. Uh, you can catch me after and show me where to look for it on the paper. Okay, you had a question for yeah, Jimmy? Jimmy, uh, a few weeks ago I sent out an uh, email about a uh, trenching deal. I just want to—I got your letter that I got from the town manager, and I want to appreciate you uh, for sending that. And I want to thank you for doing what you did here with the education, continuing education with the 10 hour and your trenching. Appreciate that a lot. Right on. Thanks, bud. Right on. Well, we got you, Jimmy. I got some some things for you. <laughs> um, for cleaning ditches, uh, who's responsible for that in subdivisions? If it's within the subdivision. Yeah. If it's a town street, um, then we are responsible for maintaining those. If it's a DOT street, then it's a DOT requirement. And those are just basically complaint driven. So if somebody calls us about an issue, then we'll go out there and investigate. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes we run into ditches that run beside properties that are private mm -hmm. or um, behind the houses, then we don't maintain right, those. Behind. There's a reason why I'm asking because uh, I've had a number of uh, complaints or uh, inquiries about, like in Windsor subdivision there, because a lot of the uh, Drains go under the driveways are so overgrown the dirt is just I mean it, it just floods over the road and, it, and water's not flowing down around the uh, to where it needs to go so that I, I told my check into it and let them know what we what we like is 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 you know obviously we want the public to contact their you know, their local com or representative but you know when they contact you if you can forward them back to us so gotcha. we can write work orders to do those things okay. so that way. I've got a phone number and a contact for, you know, John Doe, whoever's out there, gotcha. and I can call them and go out there and meet with them personally or have one of our staff members do that. Okay. And Perfect. it's just, you know, I like it to be more personal when I do that. Perfect. So I know, Perfect. you know, obviously we want everybody to call you because that's, you know, they voted for you and, you know, that's, that's the right. But, 
you know, please contact us okay. for anything. Lambs leaves, contact us so we can write work orders or follow up. Okay. You know, if something's missed, you know, in, in that case, then, you know, we can call them back and say, well, a truck went by on this day or that day. That's why your debris may or may not have been picked up or in right. cases of ditches. So usually what happens is when we go clean your ditch, then your next one, what there's done, and that kind of starts the, the domino effect. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll contact town to get because yep. yep. i mean there's a lot of them that are i mean i noticed you know just driving around in there there's i mean they're just over the years i guess the dirt filled up and the grass grew over and yeah. the water just goes over their driveway or over the road and, and some of those may be just simple enough to have guys going out of a couple of shovels and digging those out if it's something more and you're going to need more than a couple of shovels <laughs> we have to call a locate benefit or something like that yeah okay yes, and sir. the other thing is uh the american flags on the poles what's the story on them so we had, we're in the process of getting ready to put those back up for more day. We had some of them that were taken down as a, a Christmas decorations. Mm -hmm. And so we'll, uh, we'll get those back up. Okay. Um, and who, uh, the banners that were put up, did, did we approve any of them banners that were put up on, on the polls? What's the story the on that? The banners that were put up were, um, um, that was a project that our former uh, downtown manager, um, she had organized that, and so once they came in, then whatever the contract was, we were required to put them up on for at least a year or so. So that's how I don't know all the all the details. So we were just asked to put those up. So okay. that was part of a you know something that I said a previous. Was the board of, aware of that in the of the previous board? Uh, that I do not know, sir. And town. And you're saying that um. Heather did that? Correct. Yes, it was a Heather deal? Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. And just when they came in, then we were asked to put them up as part of uh, the agreement, whatever the agreement was. I have no idea what the agreement was. Does anybody know what that agreement was? Can you find out? We would like to know what that agreement was. Thank you. Look into that for us. Okay. <laughs> All right. Anything further? Moving, Jimmy? Uh, just a couple items that um, just to follow up on. Um, after the board meeting, I'll go over there and I'll hit the button on the sign and see how long the timing is. And then I'll follow up with the email that I sent over a month ago when you first brought that to my attention with Frank West from DOT to see where, where they're at on there. But I'll check the timing tonight after the meeting on that. Um, also, um, I've actually, on the trash cans that Ms. Powell had mentioned, I actually had put a couple in next year's budget. But uh, I'll follow up with Casey to see if she has any money um, in her downtown budget and see if we can go ahead and get one ordered. Now, those trash cans that are similar to the downtown ones are 1200 to $1,500. So just mm -hmm. FYI. So a little expensive. So I'll check what it needs see if to she be. has anything. Well, yes, ma'am. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Anything further from the board? or? All right. Well, uh, people, you have been a great addition to our meeting tonight. Thank you so much for being here and participating. Uh, we will need to adjourn the public meeting and go into closed session under General Statute 143.318.11A3, A5, and A6 uh, if someone will make that motion. <coughs> Okay. All in favor, please raise your right hand. Okay, we will adjourn uh, for about five minutes and we'll be in closed session. <laughs>